committee open uh, and advise uh, that this meeting is being streamed live and recorded for publishing on the internet, um, uh, including transparent outside of Australia. Council acknowledges that we are meeting on traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and we pay respect, respect to the elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today and we also expand that, extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present with us. Item two, I have an apology or rather I have a leave of absence from Councillor Abraham Zadeh and uh, Councillor Moran is not late, she has joined us. Um, I think that accounts for all of us here. Okay, moving on, item three, confirmation of minutes. Can I seek a mover to move that these are true and accurate? I can move it, Councillor Kira and a seconder, Councillor Canole. Um, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour, that is carried. Moving on to item four, discussion forum items. Item 4.1 uh, is waste management and we'll be hearing from Michelle English. Thank you, Michelle. Um, through the chair, uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for the opportunity to talk to you today about the results of our waste audits um, and also for your patience in not hearing about it last week um, as well. I'd just like to introduce um, Anna Dean Johnson, she's um, our waste project um, manager and um, she's had a lot to do with um, compiling the results that we've got for you today. Um, so, um, the purpose of today is to really provide um, a, a briefing on the results of the waste audits and the potential areas of focus um, for areas of improvement. Um, there's lots of um, opportunities um, and um, the feedback we get from you today will help us inform the new waste and, and recycling management strategy, uh, but they will also um, give us an indication of what areas um, Council would like us to prioritise. So there are three, quick, three key questions that um, we're asking of you today and they really relate to uh, the prioritisation. Um, and so they are what, you know, what are Council's views um, on um, having a consistent approach across all of our existing sites and facilities. Uh, the second is in relation to your views on prioritising education and outreach programs with a particular focus on diverting food waste um, from landfill um, and supporting those um, improved recycling uh, waste outcomes for our community, our businesses, um, operations and employees. Um, and then the third uh, question is, is in relation to ongoing support for multi-unit development. So this is a really significant um, growing area um, for waste at the moment. It, it isn't the largest, but as we have increased um, residential um, population outcomes in the city, it become uh, more and more significant. Um, and as you'll see as we go through the results of the waste audit, it is, a, it is an area there are lots of opportunities. Uh, so you see, um, I won't speak to everything um, that you have in the report, but just draw out some of the key areas. Um, you'll see that we did audits in relation to both our external services, so there are services for curbside for residential and commercial collections. Also, we provide um, bulk bin collections to um, multi-unit developments and then our public streets and our parklands. And then we also looked internally in terms of our four sort of key sites. We've obviously got libraries and community services as well, but we're our biggest um, generation um, of waste and recycling opportunities. So they're the, the CLC building next door in Eagle Chambers, the London Road Depot looking at the offices, um, the North Adelaide Golf Links and the Adelaide Aquatic Centre. Um, so, this slide up here just really gives you a, a bit of a visual about the types of services that we're talking about when we're talking about you know, curbside residential, so three, three bins of different sizes through to public streets and parklands. Um, what was really um, 
uh, a really, I think this slide provides a really good example that um, we haven't got exact volumes um, because they'll change you know, day by day, season by season. But if you're looking at our external services to our residents and our businesses, you can see that the, the biggest volume of the material that we're collecting comes from our curbside residential. And you also see that um, you know, a, you know, a reasonable amount of that is actually um, green um, in organic collection um, as well. Um, but you'll see when you're looking at those red and white striped areas for multi-unit developments, residential, commercial, they're the areas that we have seen that we've got unrecovered resources in our red waste bin. So there, that's the area for improvement that we can target to get more diversion of waste. Um, from landfill um, and it also provides a really good opportunity um, for us to reduce that exposure to the solid waste levy which we know has increased to $110 a tonne and from the 1st of January will increase to $140 a tonne. Um, if we dive straight into curbside uh, residential findings, um, you can see from the graph um, there right at the top that um, we're actually doing a bit, a bit better than the state average of 49%. We're at 53%. Um, for curbside collection, the state target's 60. So we're a little bit off that. So there's some room for improvement. Um, and you know, on, on average, our residents um, uh, basically have about 650 kilograms of waste per year, um, which is quite um, considerable. Um, what we do know is that about 61% of that we could divert further from landfill. Um, a bit of that in the co-mingling recycling um, and then about 40% of that um, into the green organics. What we um, also know is that um, only about 50% of the bins were half full um, or less. So, you know, it's, we could be exposed even further if people weren't doing the right thing. Um, some of the really good news is that our residents really understand what to do with glass, paper and cardboard. So some of those messages are really getting out there nice and clearly. But when we come to metals and hard plastics, there's some confusion. So there's a really good opportunity um, for some good public education about how you would recycle, what types of things you would recycle and put into the yellow bin. Um, we did have some um, uh, high levels of contamination around 21% into those uh, yellow commingling um, recycle bins as well. So um, that also is an area for improvement where we have um, better communications and education to get those levels of contamination down um, as well. Um, and the, that contamination um, often might be around garden organics um, or some people actually pull their recycling into a plastic bag and then in, into the recycling bin. So just some simple messaging about um, it doesn't need to be bandaged up if you just put it into the recycling bin. Um, so some really good opportunities for some improved communications and education for our residents. Um, if we go to the green organics, one of the things um, we found here is actually our residents really understand um, that we can put our um, garden um, trimmings and lawn clippings and all of that sort of thing into the right bin and they're getting that really right. Um, those people that are actually using compostable bags and understand that system are also getting it right because we're not finding those compostable <laughs> bags with food waste in the other streams but only about 7.5% of food waste is actually being recovered into the green organic skin. So there's a really good opportunity um, for education. In, in fact, not just in the residential sector, but in, in all of our sectors, in our, in our facilities, um, in our own buildings, to really target education around um, that food, uh, food scraps and waste can actually go in your green organic skin. So um, that's a bit of a, a summary around um, the residential. If we move to curbside commercial, um, quite different um, in terms of how full the bins are. So where we had quite a lot of bins that were, were not full or even half empty, um, or even more than that, 40% um, of our commercial um, red waste bins were actually over full. 
So it's definitely a, a, you know something that our businesses are relying on this service. Um, we have a challenge in that it's very difficult um, to tell the difference between a commercial curbside bin and a residential curbside bin. And the reason for that is they're collected on the same day, they look the same, and there's nothing to visually um, separate them. So there's a really Really good opportunity for putting what we call RFID tags on them um, so that we can understand who the bin user is and then align our services to those facilities, whether it's residential or commercial, because they have quite different needs. Um, you can see we've got quite a high level um, of unrecovered resources. Um, so about 20% um, of those red bins could go into the um, the yellow bins or, or possibly for the on-street carbon collection that we provide as well. Um, but again, food waste is a really big challenge um, in that area. And, and as you all know, we don't provide um, an organics service to um, our businesses as well. So that's one of the areas we think we need to look at in terms of it might not be a green bin for um, businesses. It might be some other sort of form um, of service as well. Um, one of the things that we found in the commercial um, bins me, <coughs> is that our yellow bins are actually really highly contaminated. So over 20% um, of the bin includes non-recyclable materials. Um, and when we get really high levels of contamination, um, it, it can end up um, meaning that those um, resources aren't actually accepted for by the recycling facility as well. So it's another area um, where we really need to do a lot of um, education um, around that yellow bin as well, because we don't want it to end up going to um, landfill when we've got resources in there that we can um, take out. Um, we provide a different service to some uh, residential multi-unit um, developments. So we provide bulk bins and we are actually um, in the process of transitioning some multi-unit dwellings that have curbside over to bulk bins um, as well. One of the things that, um, so I would say this is probably the area in terms of all of our external services of the biggest um, opportunity. Um, multi-unit developments are really complex um, because they involve, right at the beginning, we've got a development application in and they come up with a, a waste management strategy, but sometimes through that process to then the people living in the building and the facilities manager, all the good theoretical concepts at the beginning don't always get translated into the actual outcomes. So um, we're seeing very low diversion rates of only around 26%. So if you get the state target of 60 to 70, we're falling um, short of that. Um, but even when we are having the different streams, we're seeing really high contamination rates of stream of those different streams as well. Um, there's a really big opportunity um, to work with facility managers in, in those big, um, buildings, and it really is a uh, requires a hands-on approach right from that development phase all the way through and then when you've got residents in there. Um, we also have a lot, um, uh, you quite, can quite often have high turnover of residents in those as well or you might have students as well so people who come from different areas who've got different systems in place that don't understand our system so we really need to target um, our education um, system and um, programs to the specific needs of the people who are living in um, multi-unit developments. Mm -hmm. I've really spoken um, through that, so I'll just go through the next one. Um, we go to our public spaces. Um, as you know, um, we have public spaces on the streets and also in the parklands. So if you're looking at um, on the street, um, we only have about 16 um, recycling bins um, and the rest are waste bins and in our parklands they're all waste bins. One of the really significant challenges that we're seeing, and you can see on the slide on the right, is that even when we are having those recycling bins, um, you're having 52% of them contaminated. So when you have a bin that, that is that contaminated, they'll be rejected from the facility. And, and we see 
the recycling facility. And we see that this is actually a challenge, not just in Adelaide, it's a, a challenge in Australia and, and overseas as well. It's really important to uh, ensure that your bins are, uh, are targeted to the land uses in that area. So one system in Rundle Mall say is not going to be the same system in the parklands. So in some areas in the parklands, we had really high levels of organic waste, but that was basically, um, uh, you know, because it was next to a dog park. And um, whereas your, um, your your material that you might have in your contam in your contaminating your yellow bin in Rundle Mall could be a coffee cup that's still got wet um, uh, residue in there that then is contaminating in the clean cardboard. So it, it is really challenging um, in terms of what we do provide in our public spaces, and we really need to think about what the land uses are in each of those areas and have targeted <laughs> solutions to each of those. Um, I might just then talk to our own facilities. Um, so we looked at the Colonel Light Centre and Eagle Chambers, London Road, and North Adelaide and Adelaide Aquatic Centre. Um, and if you look at this slide, you can see that um, really the Adelaide Aquatic Centre has the highest level um, of waste or recycling material generated. Um, you can see that really big red bar there, the golf course. So what's really interesting to note is that about 50 tonnes of waste per year, this is a really significant amount, is illegal dumping. So people dumping tyres or fridges or e-waste or whatever it might be um, in and around the golf course area because those areas aren't, don't have a lot of surveillance and we're picking up that cost um, of actually then um, taking it to landfill or, or, or sorting it. Um, so when you consider that, it's an area we really need to, um, to look at. Um, and we're thinking about having some different sorting facilities at the golf course as well, so that we can recycle some of that material as well. Um, but you can also see that where we've implemented the green organics and the caddies, like in the um, Pernal Light Centre, we're actually getting some really good results. Um, the staff and, and council members really understand um, that system and we've got very, very low um, levels of contamination, almost negligible contamination in that green organic. So it's working really well where people understand what you do with it. We've got some really good opportunities in the London Road um, Depot to put that same system in place. Um, but probably the two areas that we think we can get some really good wins um, are, so flip through, to the North Adelaide Golf Links. Um, so the, we found a lot of material um, that's in the red bins we can um, put directly into the yellow co-mingling. We have a huge amount of uh, container deposits, um, like bottles and cans, out of that facility. Um, and also um, a lot of green um, organics, food organics, um, both from the kitchens and the facilities in there. So we actually think we could get some really good results um, and, and you know, possibly quite quickly, you know, over a, um, a relatively short period of time by putting in some good systems there to bring um, that sort of recycling up to well over 70%. So, so there's some really good quick wins um, in the North LA Golf um, course links. Um, and then also um, at the Aquatic Centre as well. Really um, quite unusual, we did audits of different bins in different parts of the facility. Um, so as you got to the change rooms, you had all sorts of contamination of clothing, bathers, towels that um, had reached the end of their life and ended up in recycling. Um, but then if you got close to the cafe, you had a lot of food organics um, in the bin. So there's some really good opportunities um, to for some good clear signage, but also um, really working with the cafe there um, in, in relation to the compostable um, products and, and things there as well. So both the aquatic centre and the golf links are, I think are some really good um, quick wins that we will be able to put, comparatively quick wins that um, we'll be able to put in place some good systems. Um, so from an administration um, perspective, uh, really 
we saw as prioritising sort of some short term and some medium term actions. And through the short term, is really having this consistent approach across all of our sites and facilities. So if you're here at the aquatic centre or the depot, you're getting that same experience, the same signage. You know exactly um, whether you're a customer here or, or a, um, a swimmer at the aquatic centre, what, what you would be doing um, with your different types of resources. Um, the second thing is um, around an education and outreach um, program for um, all, all of our customers, whether they're internal or external, um, with a, quite a focus on that food waste, because that's a challenge that we're seeing right across um, internal, external, um, and our own facilities. Um, so there's some really quick things that um, we can get some um, quite significant change um, in a short term. The medium term are the areas that are a, a bit more complex. So they're that multi-unit that need an ongoing um, support, multi-unit development, sorry, um, as well as looking at our streets and parklands um, and, and also looking at what are some really innovative but tailored support mechanisms to increase, to increase diversion from um, for our commercial um, waste as well. Um, so probably spoken quite long enough. Um, so if I could maybe just hand over to you and take some of your questions. Thank you for that, Michelle. Um, the way I'd like to do this is we have questions for clarity first before we give um, commentary. So I'll just open it up. Is there any, any questions for clarity on the report? Councillor Martin? Um, yeah, just for clarity. Um, the paper say, and you said also, when there's contamination in a yellow bin, that bin is thrown out. But the bins go into a truck. No one's sitting there peeling through it to see what's contamination and what's not. So does that mean the whole truck is contaminated and discarded? Or is it sorted and the contaminated material discarded? Um, so and I'll, if, I'm, if I'm incorrect, Anna Dane will jump in and um, correct me. So my understanding is that that is the whole truck. So when it is presented to a facility, it would be that on average. But if you say to me about your parklands and your on streets and they're all contaminated, well, your level of contamination is going to be um, you know, quite high. So uh, I'm not sure I understand that. So if I throw up an banana skin in my uh, yellow bin, um, then or you know, a lump of um, something that's not appropriate, I don't know, dog poo or whatever, that whole bin and whole truck is contaminated. Um, through, the, through the chair, not, not from one banana skin in that one bin. Um, so it's not based on the bin, right. but if on average the whole truck load goes and turns up at the recycling facility and the, the level of contamination that whole truck load was um, exceeded their standards in the year and yes, they could say we're not going to accept that. That would have to go to. So um, it goes on conveyor belt. Okay. okay. So it goes on a conveyor belt. Yeah. So it will get deposited first, and then that, and then that goes through the processing facility. So it, so it, it is um, quite possible that some. Um, loads might be rejected, and it's not just for our own facilities. That's for any commercial or operations or other councils as well. Through the chair, just to be clear, um, when truckloads are taken to the sorting factory, they basically go on a conveyor belt, and they do separate out the contaminated material from the recycled material, and gets packaged and, and I guess split up so that it can be used or disposed of. So it's pretty common practice. Thank you, Councillor Donald. Thank you for all of that information. Um, with the cost that's likely to be saved from better diversion, have you crunched some numbers to see roughly if we were to successfully divert all or half of the material that's currently a resource and it's going into the waste stream, roughly what that would save based on the 110 or the increase that's going up? Um, so I can talk at more general numbers. So what we do know is with the increase levy, mm -hmm. so in 2015, um, the levy cost us about 360 
2018, the increase in the levy, even though we actually slightly reduced um, our um, waste to landfill, um, cost us $549,000. So that was an increase of $180,000. We are anticipating at this, if it's at the same volume, um, it would currently in 2020 cost us about $750,000. When you actually get to um, the nuances of this, you know, X tonne taken from landfill to, um, say, organics, yeah. it's not as simple as just moving that tonne and reducing it by $140 because we pay per bin lift, we pay per weight for each stream. Um, there's, um, depending on which contract you're in, there could be a rebate for depreciation on their vehicles, um, and it's also a bin size. So we don't have the the specific you know, numbers of what that would be, but if you had a substantial shift and move, we would expect that we would be um, saving money from that, you know, mm -hmm. in the order of uh, a quarter of a million dollar increase. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, in terms of the draft uh, planning and design code, will we include in our submission content around how to ensure or to incentivize, motivate, structurally um, support uh, the better diversion of waste in multi-unit dwellings? Um, so I can't speak for um, Associate Director Shanti Ditter, um, who is our planning um, person, but we do work very closely um, across the program, uh, across our programs, Oh, she's here. Um, and that is an area that I know they are very um, strongly supportive um, of um, ensuring that the, the code is getting the best outcomes that we can for our residents. And just final question. I don't think it was in this document, although it may have been, I think it's in another document. The Roughly the percentage of uh, domestic or residential users of the green waste facility of organics do you, I'm not sure if it was in this one or if I saw it in another one, but it seemed incredibly low across the city, the number or the percentage of households that currently have choose to, so not the, the number that choose to access green waste. Do you have that? I haven't even had a look for it, but it is an opt-in service. Yeah. yeah. So um, some, some um, sure. local governments provide it mm. and you just get it. Mm. Um, the City of Adelaide is an opt-in service. That's one of the things that we would be um, looking at in, uh, well, in the education, but also in um, the development of the strategy. Is, is an opt-in service the best um, for our residents? You know, some of our residents have you know, very small cottages and they don't have room for mm. three meetings. So, and they might not have a whole lot of gun waste. It might be a better option to share a green bin in, a, in the street. So that's one of the areas that we really need to look at. And will we also be advocating to the state government around shifting the current uh, requirement for hard waste to be collected weekly in preference for an alternating weekly model whereby we prioritise green waste rather than hard waste? Uh, so we don't have a position on that at the moment, but you're correct. There is um, a legislative requirement um, at the moment that we provide um, a weekly red bin. Uh, so um, it's not what happens necessarily everywhere across Australia, and it, it's one of the areas we can look at. And certainly, if we think that's a good idea, we can advocate to the state government and green industry, as they say. Members, I might just leave the questioning there unless there are any burning points for clarification and just open up for general commentary on the key questions. Councillor Sims and Councillor Kira. Thank you. Um, thanks very much for the um, report, Michelle and, um, and team. Um, look, I agree with a lot of the uh, things proposed in terms of the quick wins. I think that definitely um, makes sense. I, I guess for me, the only thing that is missing in terms of an opportunity for us is I think there is huge um, public interest in the issue of waste at the moment. And what I'd really like to see is some kind of bold or exciting idea in terms of, as part of our um, response, particularly with the sites that we control, as a way of maybe a bit of a test, a test case as a way of generating interest. One idea I'd like to um, feed in the mix is um, the reverse vending machines for recycling that I've seen have been used um, over in Ireland. 
Um, they're a, a, a new system where people can bring in their bottles, they put them in the machine, and what they get out is a voucher, which you can spend on a local business, for example. Um, I think, you know, maybe having something like that in the central market and giving a voucher for um, businesses in the market would be a great way to support businesses in the central market also to encourage recycling and get people interested. And I saw looking at um, the feedback from Ireland, they've had a huge um, response and I think Iceland is bringing them in as well. So that something like that would really be worth while us investigating and maybe investing some money in. So my suggestion would be, yes, let's go ahead with these strategies, but maybe heading into the next budget round, let's also look at if there is a um, big picture project like that that we could roll out. And I think the um, reverse vending machine would be a really good one that would get a lot of community support and potentially give a kickback to our local businesses too. Um, through the rule, we have actually um, trialled one previously in the um, Adelaide Aquatic Centre. Okay. Um, so um, maybe I'll offline talk to you, yeah. find out those results because it's a number of years ago and, and talk to you about that. But certainly we want to look at opportunities um, to not just improve but tell the story about what we're doing, particularly in public places like the central markets and the aquatic centre. Thank you, Councillor Kerr and Councillor Martin. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Michelle. Um, uh, look, uh, it's, it's interesting stuff. Um, I think it's interesting that outside of uh, multi-storey apartment buildings um, and unfortunately commercial operations, the picture is nowhere near as bad as we may think it is. Um, I'm certainly definitely 100% in favour of uh, exhausting and trying um, creative uh, education uh, and education and prevention um, means uh, well well ahead and in fact just full stop instead of uh, creepy and weird things like uh, transparent bins. Um, so I'm very much in favour of education and not in favour of strange punitive, strange punitive measures. Um, I think um, just on, I mean we've got, so apartment towers is a real problem. Um, I think a big part of that problem is you, you go to any apartment tower, what you have is a chute at the end of each store, uh, floor, on each floor. Uh, the chute is usually not marked or poorly marked. Um, I know we don't really have uh, powers to you know, order this, but it'd be great uh, if we could get apartment towers to agree uh, that those shoots are really clearly marked with what should and should not go into the bin. I think it really comes down to a, a, a something like that. If we could get that on, on the majority of apartment floors, um, it, it may make a difference. Um, with businesses, um, I think, you know, if, if, the, if the education, uh, if we say to them, look, here is uh, the solid waste levy, here is the amount across all of, all of Adelaide, let's get this down and we can appeal to their bottom line uh, in that way, that, that might be a good way to go. So I think I'd love to see, I mean, obviously it's you know, clear that that's, that is the way forward, but I'd love to see the education be really quite targeted uh, and focused on these sort of outcomes. Um, yeah. Thank you, Councillor Martin and the Lord. Yeah, look, uh, uh, just very briefly, I, in waste management generally in the city, I think the problem is the city. We don't have the right policy settings. Uh, we don't set the right examples. Our own premises are uh, sources of great contamination in waste, but uh, we don't set a good example. Uh, I remember uh, Councillor Corbell, who was part of Team Adelaide, and ultimately became one of the victims. Um, proposed and a council accepted too one of her motions that we should investigate with a view to installing separate waste bins in public places so that there would be a green, a red and a yellow. We've not done that. Uh, and in public places bins are contaminated. That's not a surprise. Additionally, we have a patchwork policy everywhere else. In business, for example, only some businesses get a waste service. Uh, most of those are being grandfathered. And so you have a street in which there might be 30 businesses, 12 of which have a red bin, a yellow bin, some of them also have a green bin, not many. Um, and what happens is everybody who doesn't have the service uses the bins of the businesses that do. That's why the bins are overflowing, not because the owner of the bin is a prolific you know, accumulator of waste, it's because everybody in the street is using it and indiscriminately. 
that policy needs review and the city ought to be providing a waste service to all businesses. All businesses pay the same rate in the dollar. Some of them get better service from the city of Adelaide. Agreed. Some get none. Uh, and and uh, additionally, um, there need to be real incentives to businesses to adopt services like green bins. Uh, because at the moment, most uh, uh, coffee grains in this city are going into red bins uh, up and down the street. It is just in our hands and it is in our hands to do much more than education. It is about a, uh, you know, a root and branches reform of our whole waste policy. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think this information is fantastic and use the data to inform what we can do next. Um, I, I've got a couple of questions in terms of areas that we would look at. Um, Rundle Mall, I know it's a separate authority, but um, has got separated bins there. And also the North Terrace Cultural Boulevard, um, only because of their being incredibly highly trafficked areas and where you get a lot of people eating lunch. Um, the, the separated bins, um, and we've talked about this, Michelle, when we put it in at Wyman for the first couple of years, we actually had to have volunteers to assist people figuring out which bin to put them in so they're not contaminating the waste. And so it's not enough just to have an education, we probably actually have a few people around the place as well. Um, my question is around multi-languages. Um, particularly in different areas of the city where we've got high student populations, whether we're going to put um, language, because often that is actually why the stuff's going in the wrong bins. And, um, and the other one is whether we can do a few more demonstrations. Um, I know Councillor Donovan was there with me at City West when uh, Marion did a demonstration on the rubbish separation of what goes where, which was really informative and um, would be a great way to do, again, a very personalised sort of education around the list. Thank you. Are there any other questions, comments? Thank you. Um, I mean, my perspective is let's save that $250,000 and put it into our resources. That is a significant sum of money. And if we do it now, then we're not only saving us handing it over to, you know, as a, as a form of tax essentially, but we're also going to save into the future as we significantly minimise our ongoing waste and that, that tax continues to escalate. So I think we should be funneling all of that money into these programs and for sure making it consistent because we know consistency is what works. You've done extensive research, you've looked into the evidence base, you know what's going to work. So you advising us is my approach. Um, and where I think we should be going. Um, and I think absolutely the approach in terms of focusing on uh, multi-residential dwellings and looking at some of the things that you've spoken about previously in terms of the educational approach, but the systemic um, and ensuring that as um, the Lord Mayor referenced, you know, we have so many international students, Bojan was saying about it, over 20% of the city's population, a third of the population, um, are international students over <coughs> something like 36% of the city's population. There we go. Um, so we know that in other countries they recycle differently and so they come here and of course we, we do it differently and so we get it wrong. So I think having that uh, systemic educational focus uh, would be yeah, absolutely vital. So tick, tick, tick to everything and let's put some dollars into it and get it done. Thank you, Councillor Hoy and then Councillor Canole. Thank you, Michelle. Yes, yes, yes to all of that. <laughs> and uh, just to add on to the law mayor's suggestion though, and also like Helen's suggestion, we have a lot of people who are living in the city are coming from any other countries that are, they either like have language barriers or or the way how they actually recycle is different as how we do it here. So instead of having different languages like Rome, I think we would have rather have like pictures, stickers on different bins. People can actually see it before they put stuff in the bin and that will save us a lot of headaches. Other than that, like at nowadays, 
many apartment buildings will have a TV screen in their lift and they can play a short video about how you actually separate your rubbish. And we can provide those videos to the body corporation and I believe they will be happy to do so because as a body corporation manager, they quite often will face a problem that say solo waste collections, whatever we call them and say your bins have been contaminated because their residents don't know how to do it. And, they, and, and the owners of the apartment have to pay extra on their strata fee mm -hmm. to collect those contaminated rubbish bins. Mm -hmm. All right, so I think education is far more important than anything else at this stage. Councillor Kline. Mm -hmm. And just thinking about the multi-year uh, unit uh, developments, etc. I mean, uh, the difficulty we have is that uh, they're not generally like if you've got your own bin in the backyard, you're attached to it. It's you know, in a sense of you know what's going on, what's going where, and it's convenient. And part of the problem is that the, the lack of convenience means that you'll bundle it together because it's just a bit hard. And so, if we have the ability to uh, to uh, help closer into the into the units and saying, well, you know, and so there is like we have a little small black a black green bin on our, on our, kit, well, our kitchen sink, um, and we put all that in there. We've actually increased the amount of green waste we put in there because. It's, that's now convenient, but if we can help them to be convenient, that means that they'll be able to bring it down already segregated well, whereas often it's one bit in the house. And that then, uh, you know, I mean, it's just too difficult to do that. Um, I mean, again, if we look at the parks, I mean, during the normal week, I mean, it is it's a place where that is uncontrolled and usually there's the variety of people that don't, uh, again, they don't have such a great uh, um, attachment to the recycling. But the part of the problem you've got is that, um, uh, there needs to be also enough bins at the right times. I mean, we've gone often enough for an, it's on a popular, uh, popular weekend. The thing is overflowing. No matter what you want to do, uh, you know, you've got to try and get it in there. So it is about the, ensuring that you have the uh, sufficient of them. I mean, with businesses, etc., yeah, there is a great disparity. I mean, uh, with business and and the availability of bins, etc. And again. Um, and I suppose they're making them accountable for their bin is, is useful. In other words, you know, uh, uh, this is my bin. Seeing about ensuring that there's a bit of equity around the various uh, businesses that uh, you know there isn't uh, a need for someone to you know dump more uh, product into one into the other that that would be really useful. But also, I mean, if, if someone if there is an issue around cost etc., then the owner of that will start to look at it a bit as well, saying, well, if I'm doing if everything's right, then uh, you know I don't have an issue. But if someone is doing something. That also that that's their problem to help alleviate our problem, and I think that will also assist so that you know we do have an issue. Why is it? And what is it we can do? And that means that uh, you're at least addressing it uh, more quickly because right now it just all happens and, and no one is you know, no one's able to do that. And I think you know, and it's again that uh, uh, I mean you can't. I mean there are a lot of businesses that make a lot of rubbish and a lot of uh, you know, green waste, etc. I mean that's difficult. But at what point uh, you know is it a commercial uh, um, issue? And what is it a council issue? And I don't know how you quite come to terms with that. Thank you, Councillor No, Unless there are any other comments, I'll just make a quick comment. Um, to the first question, yes, consistency um, across our own uh, areas is key. Um, education, I think, is important, um, but we need it to be innovative. We can't just have some sort of run of the mill campaign. I encourage you to look at examples overseas as well. I think there are, we don't have to reinvent the wheel there. Um, and now that the issue has been adequately moralised, we can now target people's heartstrings to affect behavioural change. Um, on the third question, uh, I think yes, we should be uh, prioritising ongoing support for the multi-use developments and expanding where possible. Um, however, I think there's, there's two aspects to it. One, we need to be confident that they are recycling and doing their waste separation properly, and that perhaps needs to be a requirement for us to deliver that service to them. And there's a little bit of a carrot and, and stick approach there. The other aspect is um, uh, that it would be good for us to try and incentivize a reduction in strata fees um, uh, because that's a large part of, of the cost of strata. So, but I'm just concerned that we won't necessarily see a fee reduction be passed on if we do then pick up that service um, and deliver it to, to other apartment buildings. Um, uh, just some further feedback on the organics um, uh, waste. I think the service we offer is by and large very good accounts. Obviously we give out free free bins and, and free compostable bags and what have you. One thing that my household has, has um, encountered, we don't have space for a green bin. 
Um, and so we need to try and find, and we talk to friendly neighbours and what have you about, you know, can we stick it in your bin and that sort of thing. So whether or not we have um, bins throughout the community, compost bins um, around the place that can be used or other central locations. Um, and, and as well, I think that would also equally apply to um, uh, apartment buildings and strata um, and just in that sort of thing. But uh, I'll leave it there and we will move on to the next report, which is uh, 4.2 and I'll pass to the Deputy CEO. Thanks, Chair. Um, so tonight I just wanted to share with you, with the help of Tracy and Alex, um, some thoughts and ideas in relation to how we'll support you in building the 2020-2021 business plan and budget. Um, since I've had the finance function since the 1st of July, it's clear that there's a range of improvements we can make um, to how we work with you and our community to make sure that there's a transparent process where you have the information you need to make informed decisions about how funding is raised and then how that funding is prioritised and therefore spent. So some of the key differences that you'll see as part of this year's process include, we'll have a hopefully a new um, strategic plan and um, the budget will be built around supporting delivery of that with a view to developing a four year delivery plan associated funding, which will turn into a much more of a rolling approach. And secondly, we've initiated an internal audit with KPMG to review our processes and make sure that we're um, developing um, in a way that uh, supports council members in their core duties. Um, those audit recommendations will come through to audit committee early next year and we're trying to make sure we've got a bit of flexibility in our approach to, um, to enable us to incorporate any of those recommendations that we can. Um, and the third element that you'll notice quite a difference in is strengthening the role of our audit committee. Um, so we will have a new audit committee in place uh, from February. They've expressed um, desire and interest in making sure that there's oversight and, and that their independent advice is brought through to um, committee and council in the coming months. So you'll start to see um, audit committee taking a much stronger role um, in terms of our um, understanding our financial sustainability. Thank you, Claire. Any questions about the... Yeah, there's a oh, bit, yeah. little bit more. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I was turning a page. Um, so, <laughs> I was turning a page. Um, so, in terms of the types of principles that you'll see in our um, in our budget process this year. Um, being financially responsible and sustainable is going to underpin the approach that we take with you. Um, we've already kicked off um, a piece of work that Vanessa shared with you back in August, um, sorry, in October, around our services and making sure that we're delivering those efficiently and effectively. Um, we're also really mindful that we do need to create the capacity um, to enable current and emerging priorities and projects to be able to be funded. And obviously, a core role of council is to maintain and enhance infrastructure. Um, and Clinton's already um, commenced some work to better understand um, the condition of our assets and then making sure that we're prioritising those assets. Um, so uh, there's been some common themes over the last uh, four years and clearly what we're hearing from you is some of those things will continue. Um, most councils um, decide what they're going to deliver and then set their rates accordingly to um, deliver on what they commit to delivering. Um, here because our rates income is obviously um, comprises much less of our overall revenue. Um, we tend to um, talk to council members as early as we can to understand um, what their approach is going to be, particularly around rates. And the last four years, we obviously um, committed to keeping rates as low as possible by freezing rates. And we've heard from you that that's going to be an important principle. Um, and along with that, how we support businesses that are here in the city um, while maintaining um, the partnering approach around co-delivery where possible of major new infrastructure projects. 
Um, and as uh, we discussed during the build of the strategic plan, uh, making sure financial sustainability um, is front and center in terms of how we operate. Um, and over the next four years, we do have some major projects that we need to fund and deliver on. Obviously, Central Market Arcade and ATH of Connell, so those will be the main priorities. Um, and we, as I mentioned earlier, um, with the work that Vanessa's doing, you know, the ongoing review of our services and seeking direction um, from council around which of those services um, you want either more information on or you want us to do a real deep dive in terms of um, how we deliver them. So I'll hand over to Tracy and Alex who will talk about the um, simplification um, in terms of how we structure our funding. Thanks, Claire. Um, so in developing the approach to the budget process, we had a clear view to simplify the approach and the presentation of the budget um, into three key components, which is operations, projects and infrastructure. So the services we provide to the community are funded by operations, which cover all our business and our business as usual activities. The primary activities to support the delivery of the strategic plan is funded through projects. And finally, the investment to maintain and enhance our cities is through infrastructure. In future workshops, we will present the operations budget by service category, as Claire has mentioned, to provide a clear view of how and where we spend our rates and other income. Um, a key change has also been to recognise ongoing annual activities such as grants and sponsorships, City Connector Bus, Christmas in the City as business as usual activities. So although these will no longer be classed as projects, we will ensure there is still appropriate transparency on the proposed spend on these activities and they will sit under operations. Um, going forward, we'll continue to detail the proposed projects and infrastructure, but include a summary of how these activities are funded by each budget category and how they will support the delivery of strategic actions within the 2020-24 strategic plan. Um, in addition to this, I'm talking about the revenue. So um, growing the revenue side of the ledger is as important as looking at the expenditure side. Our income growth is presently dependent on growth in property valuations, new developments and on-street parking as income from rates and parking make up over 80% of our operational income. In looking for new ideas and some innovative thinking, we held a sharp tank session recently with our managers and associate directors, where ideas have been explored and we'll do some further feasibility work before we come back to you next year. Ideas included maximising our on-street parking revenue, for example, exclusive use of parking bays via new parking permits, expanding the introduction of paid parking into commuter areas and rescinding the courtesy letter. Commercialising that underground infrastructure, such as conduits via encroachment fees, and creating third party advertising opportunities on council owned assets. A key consideration is a future growth in rates income. Noting the intention to continue to freeze the rate in the dollar, the rate in the dollar has not increased since 2014, with council relying on the growth of property values and new developments and additions to fund our operations, infrastructure, and projects and the emerging priorities in recent years. As a council, we need to consider the future projection of new developments and valuation growth. We also assume CPI um, for fees and charges. And as you saw um, last week uh, during the council, we'll continue to look at opportunities to simplify and reduce our fees and charges. We are progressively reviewing each of our commercial businesses, which includes the Aquatic Centre, Golf and the U Parks. And um, the review of the strategic property portfolio is well progressed. And it's important that we maximise our community benefit and the financial return from our business and property portfolio, leveraging on opportunities as we have with the Central Market Arcade. <laughs> Thanks, Tracy. So just to confirm, Audit Committee um, are absolutely going to provide uh, more oversight and provide some best practice advice um, in relation to our strategic financial management. Um, they're committed to helping us review the long-term financial plan and any other associated policies. Um, so with the um, audit committee coming on board in February, um, the, you know, my observation over the past few years is a huge focus on the risk side of their um, terms of reference, but we want to balance that with a more um, oversight on the financial side as well. Um, we'll be looking to your advice and guidance just on how we prioritise 
um, particularly um, over much more of a four-year tight rolling approach um, and with the uh, delivery plan um, currently getting developed we'll be building that alongside um, the business plan and budget so in, this es in essence what you'll receive is year one of a four-year rolling plan. Um, we're also really keen to build on the engagement from the strategic plan. So we've had some um, really good ideas and feedback from the community um, to date, and we're going through the form, uh, formal statutory engagement and consultation now um, on, uh, on the draft plan. Um, and so we'll be wanting to build on that. Um, and we're looking for some uh, new methods around how we might engage so that there's a lot more um, community input and understanding around how the uh, money is spent. So that's the general intent around community engagement and we'll bring that through to you next year. Um, finally, the, the main chunks of work pretty much are at the usual time frames. Um, I was reflecting uh, the, this morning in a conversation with uh, Michael Sedgman, who um, Councillor Moran's probably anyone here that still remembers him, but he um, was our GM of finance for about seven years. Um, we used to have between 11 and um, 14 sessions with council to build the business plan and budget. So I'm not proposing we have that many, but what I'm keen to make sure we do is have um, more regular touch points and um, we're trying to coordinate that through um, timing with the audit committee then into committee um, and depending how the discussion goes later around your uh, committee structures there may be an opportunity to um, spend a bit more time on, on that spare Tuesday night um, on the business plan and budget. So we're We've already commenced and the, the teams and ADs are starting to do a um, bottom-up approach and we'll be bringing and starting those discussions with you in February. So just any questions or comments or thoughts? Thank you, Councillor Sims. Thanks, Chair. Um, comment. Firstly, thank you uh, for the presentation. It's really useful, um, useful information, so thank you. I guess a few things. Um, for me, and I know my view on, on this is the is a minority, I think a minority of one uh, view actually, um, but you know, I, I'm very much in the camp of saying that we should work out what we want to do in terms of key services that we offer to the community. Look at that first, and then if we find um, that we can't make it work, then have a conversation with the community about rates. Um, and see whether people are willing to pay a little bit more to um, get um, you know, an enhanced level of service. I think one of the big problems that we um, are facing is that a lot of our um, spending is being tied up in big infrastructure projects, many of which are meritorious. Um, but you know, we're about to have a discussion shortly around the Aquatic Centre, for example. Um, and uh, I think you know it's appropriate for us to have a discussion with the community about how do we continue to offer this level of service? Is there something more that you would like? Are you willing to pay a little bit more in terms of rates? So I just make that point, rather than locking ourselves into this straight jacket year after year of saying that we're not going to increase um, rates. In particular, I'd really love for us to um, look at um, rates for um, or rate levers that we can pull for um, property owners that have a vacant property in the city that they're not activating. I think that's a big um, issue for us in the CBD. There are lots of uh, property owners that own property and they're doing nothing with it. Um, and I think that's a problem in terms of driving down business confidence. So I'd love to look at what levers we can pull in the new year, potentially hiking up their rates and use it or lose it kind of approach, which has worked in other states. The final point I would make um, is uh, on the idea of public-private partnerships or advertising on public space. I'm really concerned about that. That's not something that sits well with me. We've seen debates around that in Sydney. There was a huge furor about the Opera House, for instance, and that being turned into a billboard. I think public space is public space. It's got to be for the good of the community. And when you start privatising or commercialising that space and turning it into advertising opportunities, I think that moves against the spirit of the public realm. So that's not something I'd um, like to see administration progress. 
but let's look at other opportunities to boost um, revenue. Thanks for the work. Thank you. Any others? Councillor Martin. Oh, uh, just a quick request to the administration. Uh, each year that I've been a member of council, we spend uh, most of the time allocated to the budget arguing about the $30 million capital works program and at the conclusion of which there is no further discussion. Could we have the discussion this time starting with the general operations and other budgets and the capital budget last? Thank you. Did you want to respond to that? We'll, we'll take that on notice and we'll yeah, do it. It will depend on the timing of when we get information internally back, but we've certainly heard you loud and clear, Councillor Martin. Oh, thank you. Endeavour to meet your wish. That would be great. I'd echo those loud and clear remarks. Um, anyone else? Councillor Canole and Councillor I suppose just uh, if we're thinking about council and, and uh, the fact we are limiting our ability to uh, raise funds from the usual means um, and, and if you're looking at uh, the others we, we are actually using uh, fees and all sorts of things as a growth uh, within our budgets etc we do need to get a bit more inventive and I do think you know uh, the shark tank idea about trying to find ways to uh, create value that is still in the public good but it is something that we can deliver that uh, will give us an advantage or and and also uh, help to spread the, the way we're uh, you know raising our funds so that we can deliver services etc and it is important that we find other ways to do that and and some of it may include advertising it may include uh, doing things that um, you know where we can uh, do things effectively because it is about us as a business and we are still a business um, uh, that can deliver things that will you know enhance the city but at the same time enable us to deliver other services but also create a value that we can uh, sustain and i think you know we've got to be a bit more uh, you know broad in our thinking than than giving it just as that fundamental old-fashioned uh, way of raising some dollars thank you councillor thank you chair um just a couple of comments um i think the uh, Long-term approach to freezing the road and the dollar may or may not be sustainable, depending on what we think uh, we can project in the way of development that may be hitting our streets. The reality of the situation remains that uh, the only way we've been banking in the last six years of freezing the rate of the dollar was on the back of significant um, revaluations and also new business. If those two things don't exist as a result of a turn in the economy or potentially developers that are not developing and there's been a shift in the market and a change, which we've seen recently also happen from a land tax perspective, et cetera. So we just don't know what those impacts are. I think it would be uh, important for us to try to project to some degree what we think um, we are seeing through the pipeworks, be it through SCAP or CAP, mm -hmm. and what we would anticipate will be developed. And on that basis, over the next five or 10 years, we can get an idea to whether, whether we're gonna see growth or not in our rates. If we don't think we're gonna see growth, then it's a separate discussion because for every year um, that we don't raise the rate uh, versus CPI, uh, we may be potentially putting, you know, going backwards and putting pressure on a future council. So I think at least understanding what the, what the scope of growth is would be really important. Uh, with regards to new income, um, I think it's something that I've always sort of wanted to look at. I know our car parking business is a, is a significant revenue stream that also may, may or may not have a future. And we don't know what the future of that looks like over the next decade. Uh, with regards to where it starts for me from a budget perspective, and I'm not sure if we're going to get the chance in this budget to look at the service review and the core core business, because I think that's where it starts. I think the reality is to what Councillor Sim said before, which I agree with, is it really starts at the basis of what services do we want to deliver over the term of the year or be over the term of 10 years. And then based on that minimal prerequisite of service, then we know we need to collect X amount of money. Then there will be projects of passion that each council may have uh, for that year. And then again, those would be funded depending on, on what the council's capabilities are. I guess if the council is tilting towards a higher debt because there's a significant amount of projects that are being built, then you have to be more cautious. Um, and if, if it's not the case, then we can, uh, we can flick in the other direction. Uh, with regards to other revenue sources, I think 10 gig is something we need to start looking at in the second iteration of that and what that looks like for us in the long-term financial plan because we know there is, 
I guess, revenue to be made from the 10 gig network. We just need to understand that a bit more. Um, marketing, look, we currently do it, just to some of the councillors' comments around that. So Stobie polls around the city of Adelaide today, people have to put up um, banners by, you know, getting cranes and printing and doing all that sort of work. That currently does take place at the moment in the city and there's marketing of festivals and a whole heap of other things that takes place at events. I think there's an opportunity for us to flick a switch in colour the city. Just one more minute, uh, Chair, if that's all right. Sure, um, potentially there's an opportunity for us to be able to digitally flick a switch and, and, and market the city. And I'm just talking about us marketing um, uh, our own uh, marketing events and other businesses, but potentially marketing city businesses and also marketing city events. Surprise. So um, look, look, there's a game on, why not? But potentially some of that thing, some of these things that we may want to consider of digital displays. Telstra is already doing it on our public realm and they are collecting revenue from it. Um, we've already seen some of them come up. I'm not saying on every single street, but potentially on some bigger roads uh, where we may want to consider it. Um, bus shelters are doing it. They're all doing it. We're just on our own public realm and we're not collecting any funds. So look, I think there's an opportunity there for us to have a duality where there we could actually market community events and at the same time generate revenue for the city instead of to have the stop traffic, pull banners up, pull banners down, um, especially when we want to market Christmas in the city and do all the things that we want to do. I think there'll be a significant amount of revenue that we could raise there using council assets. I don't think we should have a park, uh, market in the parklands and that sort of thing, but for everything else, uh, I think there's an opportunity for at least to have a chat. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Uh, yes, look, I disagree with uh, working out what you want to supply and then rating to that level. No other business, no household ever does that. I want like a swimming pool, a three-storey house, a helicopter, so I'm going to go out there and, and get it. Every other business and household works out what it can raise, what its ratepayers and contributors can afford, um, and then we should work out what we can do with that money. That's a sensible thing to do. Um, if we actually went out and did a master plan that we'd all want, I mean, it would cost trillions. Um, and I'm not that interested in, in um, you know, council, council laws, individual wild and crazy plans. That's not talking about separating the bus lap and everything like that. That's you know, blue sky thinking, which I think is about the most dangerous thinking we can often do. Um, I think they're freezing the rate of the dollar. It's, the rates still go up because the property valuations go up. Um, it has to be a bedrock policy. Uh, some of us here that aren't boasting about and take credit fought hard to get that. Um, and uh, I think that should stay. If growth isn't happening, and um, business is flagging, the last thing they need us to do is charge them more rates. We should tighten our bills, make our businesses pay, not by selling them off to private industries, making them pay. That's why we voted here, not to do the easy stuff like jack up the rates, sell off the park lands. You, you were voted here to be clever and to work out how to run the city without doing the easy stuff. Putting rates up is the easy stuff. Um, you. you never mention um, the administrative costs of this council are huge, and the new administration has been making um, inroads into that, but it is still a great big fat uh, cash cow juggernaut that everybody takes advantage of, <laughs> and um, nobody seems to, to as soon as people have been here for about six months, they forget, some people forget this is other people's money. And I think this council's shown that we have forgotten that quickly. We need to spend it on what people want. And I think the rubbish um, recycling was a really good, they, they do want that. They want trees. We're getting up to another one here where we're ripping out a beautiful palm tree. Um, we do it. If people trusted us, really trusted us to spend money wisely, it wouldn't be, easier. But I know as a rate payer that if you chat double my rates, I have no real faith that you're not going to do it in some fancy blue sky thinking project which councils have done. We've got way too much development going on. We should not be looking at um, 88 O'Connell Street as well as the Market Arcade in this council term. And then I think the Lord Mayor or somebody suggested we look at doing stage one of the 
Victoria Square. We cannot afford all these things. Can I have a show of hands for Councillor No, no, it's all right, I'll stop. Councillor Sims? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Does anyone else wish to comment on this report? No, I'll just leave um, my remarks. Um, I'd rather us uh, have a straitjacket on us as a council than put a straitjacket on our ratepayers, um, whether businesses or residential. I think people are doing it tough out there at the moment and we should seek to live within our means. I echo other councillors' remarks that I think we can do a little bit better and we can do more with less. I wouldn't say that we're a big um, fat lumbering beast, but um, I think we should always seek to do what we do better. Um, uh, and I would say on revenue streams, it sounds very exciting, the stuff for, around infrastructure and what have you. Telstra was actually mentioned. Um, and one thing that I would encourage administration to look at um, is the fact that uh, I've heard of this happening in the other states and other council areas. Telstra are seeking to renew the leases that they have on their um, uh, on their uh, in 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 ground phones that they have. They're slightly expanding the footprint of those, and they're placing within them five uh, G technology. I think if they are going to seek to make more money off the space that they have taken from us already, or at least from us already. Um, then we should be factoring that into the cost of infrastructure as well, um, uh, because that is going to be a huge, if we're talking about blue sky thinking, the internet of things and things is going to come along uh, pretty quickly. So we should be seeking to factor that into potential revenue streams for infrastructure as well, because at the moment they're currently sneaking that in. Um, I think we make a lot of money off of it, um, and we're not going to see a dime or any benefit to know it's our space. So I'll just leave you with those remarks. And we will move on to the next item of business. Um, recommendations to Council, item 5.1 on the Adelaide Aquatic Centre. I'll seek a mover for that. So we have to move for this. Councillor Kouros and a seconder. Councillor Moran. Councillor Kouros, do you wish to speak? So if you're right, Councillor Moran. I uh, don't think there's, there's nothing in this report that we haven't known for quite a long time. It's an interesting timing of this report. Um, but I don't think there's much to say about it. We all know that the, um, the Aquatic Centre has, has been a credit to the administration of this council that's kept it, kept it going with sticky tape and chewy. Um, the new roof was a bit of a shock. But we have taken an ageing aging facility past its use by date. For the last 10 years, I have been fighting the SAM and others saying that this we have to have a succession plan. We have to have, we can't wait till it's leaking all its water in the parklands. We can't wait till it's an emergency situation. We have waited till it's an emergency situation. And now we're facing an emergency solution where we should have been looking at lobbying the state government to replace the city bars down on the riverbank, which they wanted to do. Uh, we should have been looking at rebuilding open air pools such as Hazelwood Park, which don't cost as much to run. We should have been looking at all the other options. Now we're looking at one option because it is an emergency because councillors here, no, no one here sitting here, did not listen to the fact that it was disastrously coming to an end. Uh, we were getting um, rather um, confusing messages from the administration because the, the councillors no longer have a close relationship with the running as they used to of the Aquatic Centre. I was the chair of the authority for many years, so I knew what was going on. But to get that to other councillors was almost impossible. There was a sort of like, just keep it going, Tom can do it, and Tom did do it. And now we're facing the end of it. It costs us a lot of money, it has for a long time. And we're now in a crisis situation where we're forced to make emergency, not sensible decisions. But this is a good report. It was a good report five years ago, and it's a good report now. Thank you, Councillor Sims, and then, and then the Lord. Uh, thank you, Chair, and yes, thank you, Administration, for the, um, the report. I guess um, one of the things that really leaps out to me here is that with an investment of um, money, we could um, turn this around, we could improve the um, level of service offered. What is lacking um, is the political will to do so. And, you know, I know some people say, oh, where are we going to find $10 million or where are we going to find $15 million or where are we going to um, find, you know, four or $6 million to address some of the short-term issues. But fundamentally, this is a community service. 
Um, and I don't want us to be a city council that doesn't offer a community swimming um, facility like other cities around the country. I think people expect a city council to offer some concept of public baths and it's for the um, public good. And you know that means it may not turn a profit. It's not intended to. It's a public service. It's used by community groups um, and uh, it should be accessible to everybody. So what I'd really like to see us going forward is when we talk next week um, about uh, proposals coming from external providers, that we also talk to the community about their views on keeping this in public hands and whether they'd like us to spend the money to do that, because I suspect there would be strong support from the community for um, keeping uh, this service in public hands for the public good, um, rather than saying this is all too hard, we can't find the money, so let's try and get an external provider to swoop in, um, which seems to have been the narrative um, that we've heard in the media around this. So yes, I think it's useful information for us to have. The timing is interesting coming um, uh, at the moment, um, but it was requested by council um, and uh, it's good to see the information. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, mine is just to say thank you. I think it's the first time in the, all the years that I've been associated with council that I've had all the information in one place at one time. Um, it's an excellent report and gives us great information uh, moving forward. So thank you to the team, Tom. Thank you. Any other speakers? Councillor Curtis. I, might, I too would like to say thank you um, in regards to the Biden's report because in the last 15 years we've been hearing a lot of information about what the council has discussed in at council and what has not eventuated, what has eventuated. And it appears to me that there has been um, a lot of discussions from council in and from administration in regards to the future of the Aquatic Centre. And we're going back to 2003, which we can see that we clearly wanted to partner with the, the government in regards to the Aquatic Centre. I can see that through every motion, um, mo they've been carried, they've been, su been successful. So that tells me that councillors all have been committed to making sure that um, this aquatic centre uh, continues. Uh, I can continuously see that we even tried to gift it at one stage to the state government that didn't want any part of it. I can see that. Um, so I can see there have been a lot of ideas and a, a lot of um, strategies have been put in place by councillors to wanting to commit, committed to wanting to be this to be part of the community. Um, so I can't see anything in here to suggest that um, no one has, um, you know, been putting forward ideas for this to be to continue to be a you know, community asset. You know, interesting enough that you know even has been talks about privatising back in 2017. So um, I really thank you for the clarity in regards uh, to the history of the centre the last 15 years, and I can see that there has been a lot of um, uh, you know a lot of thought being put into it by past councillors and the administration and how to continue the future of the aquatic centre. It's unfortunate that we've gotten to this point that we that it needs some major works and what that will be, we'll come up with a needs analysis report for it to be uh, clearly to know how much money we'll need for it to continue for another 20 years. Councillor Abia and Councillor Martin. Um, look, just to echo remarks, it's been really good um, because for us, we've always received a lot of ad hoc information when audit committees and external committees and external questions of councils have come to us with requests of funds, improvements, et cetera. And this really sort of defines the story very clearly. And look, for me, even looking at the history, um, there was a point of time where I think, you know, sort of led us to where we are today. July 2003, a recommendation of council declines the offer from the Office of Recreation and Sport to submit a proposal to develop the facility into a state aquatic centre of FINA standards. Um, that was carried by the council, um, and that was a 2003 um, committee meeting of business and operations. And the interesting part there for me is that one, um, at one specific stage in history, the council made a decision uh, for the Spade Aquatic Centre to go to Marion. They did. I mean, that, that is the motion that we have here before us that was voted for and endorsed by council. 
Um, and I think from that so point, point of order, order Councillor Moran, did you have a point of order? I, I did have a point of order because this is incorrect, and I'd like to explain that. The council. I'm not interested in it. Could you please explain the point of order? No, statement is accurate. It's, uh, your point of order can be when a statement's not accurate. The council had presented its plans to the <coughs> government and was rejected, and then didn't decided not to proceed with a formal application because the government had said no. I was part of that. Kim Hill drew up the plans. We went to see. I think it was Liberal government. No, it would have been Labor government. Uh, they said there was no way that they would um, put it there. It wasn't worth us continuing throwing money in. So we did act, actually very actively support to go there. I went there with, um, it was Jane Owen Smith, I can't remember now, uh, with our very expensive plans for King Hill. When set, they said, don't bother put formal plans in, we're going to Marion. So we voted on council not to beat a dead horse. But that's not thank fine. you, thank so, you, Councillor Moran. Please continue, Councillor. Thank, yeah. thank you very much. Look, uh, it's very clear on public record that council declined the offer from the Office of Recreation and Sport to submit a proposal to develop the facility into a state aquatic centre, which, in my opinion, would have led for discussions with Marion and would have seen an opportunity for that state facility to be in the city. Unfortunately, it didn't end up being in the city. That is a motion, if Councillor Moran was accurate, I think wouldn't have been carried by council. There would have been at least some reference there to, um, um, to that concept plan, or at least would be that council would be sad <laughs> that it wasn't accepted. But look, the reality remains is that's in the past. Um, for me, what's interesting is um, whether we decide to take this on board or not is a question, whether we partner with other suburbs is a question as well. But the reality of the situation remains is that we only have 10.4% of annual visits are from our ratepayers in the city. Uh, when we look at the whole rateable base um, of the city of Adelaide of 100 million, 15, 20, 25, 30 million is a significant outlay, which usually is outlaid by business. Um, and to have only 10% um, of ratepayers using it, I think is a, is a bit of a shame. So when we're talking about a community outcome, uh, I'm all for community outcomes when our ratepayers don't have to fork the bill on their own. Um, so I think, look, if the council decides to retain an aquatic facility in the city of Adelaide where they want to own and operate, and we go down this line of investment, uh, I think it's important and it's very crucial that we don't do that without the support of neighbouring councils and potentially the state government if they are interested. Uh, because if this is a community facility, it's a community facility for all South Australians, not just for our ratepayers. And it's unfair just for our ratepayers to pay for it. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Martin. Yeah, look, I find it uh, interesting that uh, this information, which relates to periods when most of this council weren't members of the council, is being construed in such a way as to assist their arguments in favour of handing the facility, the aquatic centre, to the crowd. Councillor, I, I, just, I, just I just draw you to the report, which is talking about the history well, of the potential the water? future. Councillor Carros, Councillor Carros, there is no point of order. I'm just drawing Councillor Martin to the, to the relevance of his statements. Well, uh, the relevance of my statement is that people who are in favour of the Crow's proposal, like Councillor Kuros, like Councillor Habib, no, no, I, look, I'm happy if you wish me to, to tell you, Councillor Kuros said in her brochure, there is no doubt a new aquatic centre partnered by the Crow's could become a key attractor for North Adelaide. If that is not support, I do not know. Yeah, but Councillor Martin, that is, that is not the report. We're not here to debate no, the no, no, or no, otherwise really. of what we'll be debating well, next and, week. Well, if you could please make remarks on what is exactly in the report. Uh, what I'm suggesting to you is that there is no case that is put by these documents for this to not be a community facility. Mm -hmm. And its usage by people, whether they are residents of the city or not, is immaterial. We do not have the same arguments about Rundle Mall or Gawler Place. They are not used <coughs> by more than 10% of the residents of Adelaide, I can assure you. And yet it never arises that we should expend ratepayers' money on upgrading those facilities. These are arguments that are all specifically constructed around information that is released one week before council is due to consider handing that facility to the Crows. That is the long and the short of it. It is a crafted campaign that has a media angle. And I'll wager that by Monday, certainly before we meet, 
the Sunday Mail, the Advertiser, or someone will have complete copies of the plans of the Crows. Relevance, Councillor Martin, assist, could you please bring it back to the report? assist the campaign. They're talking about uh, history, not the future. Uh, look, uh, I'm talking about history, all right, and, and history has a wonderful way of repeating itself at this council. Um, I, I suggest to everyone that the information is informative. It tells us no more than that which we know. It is a community facility that's required expenditure, and I dare say considerably less than we have spent on Rundle Mall and Gawler Place in the same period. Thank you. If there are no other speakers, then I'll go to Councillor Corros to sum up. I believe, uh, can I ask a question before I sum up as well? Uh, you may ask a question before you sum up, yes. Yeah, so just to clarification, this report is as part of a motion that we, re we require uh, information regarding the history of the <coughs> centre, is that correct? Page 46 it says that. Yeah. Through you know, so sure remember, uh, refer members to the executive summary, which actually states council on the 24th of September, which wasn't too far ago, actually resolved this as a motion of notice. And uh, whilst the timing is a big question, the reality is we're trying to bring this back as quickly. Well, I think it's, uh, like I said, it's a, it's a very good report for us to be able to have a really good summary of the history of the motions and the questions that have been put in place in regards to uh, over the years for the Aquatic Centre. I also um, like to state that uh, you know this will formulate you know also in the needs analysis report we would that would be brought forward to us as well um, so we would be able to get a clear snapshot what the what the centre will need so the community can make a decision on the, on the future of the aquatic centre and I think this is great work and uh, we would need to give clarity to the community um, in regards to this centre overall. Thank you. I put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. We now move to item 5.2, Tang Montilla Riparian Restoration Project, investigation into relocation of Canary Date Farm near Albert Bridge. I'll seek a mover for this. Councillor Martin and a seconder. Uh, no, I have an alternative motion. You have an alternative motion. Have you circulated it ahead of time? But no, there's no need to uh, chair it. it. <laughs> It came up in conversation with Councillor Moran a moment ago, and the amendment is uh, that Council 1 does not approve. And then just delete 2. Is that that's the extent of the variation? Yes. Yes. Do you have a seconder? Councillor Moran. Okay. Councillor Martin. Uh, look, I reserve my right chair. Uh, it's pretty clear, and I know that Councillor Kira is busting to speak, so I'll reserve my right. Councillor Moran? Uh, yes, look, we, uh, these farms are easy to relocate. Um, I am somewhat of an expert in these farms and have two <coughs> big river farms in my house that were removed much bigger. Uh, than that and repositioned. I was just driving over the bridge today. I hadn't seen this in the in the um, in the agenda and with a, a car full of visitors and said, oh, look at that beautiful palm as you go across <coughs> the beautiful old zoo bridge. It could live there for another hundred years. It doesn't even need to be removed. This scorched earth approach. They did that near the zoo on Frome Road um, it, it, on the other side, um, removed all the beautiful trees there and it's now just grass and weeds because it was never replaced. Um, I don't. I think that the introduced trees, especially the Fleet River date palms, are part of our history, and um, that there should be a respect for that. Um, I'm, I would also like to. This will. Um, I think that Alex and I will fail in this uh, motion, um, but I would like. Um, I would like to put a bid in for the palm, and I'll, I'll rehouse it myself at my own cost because they are easy to do, very easy to do. And uh, what I'd prefer is that it remo it was, if it has to be removed, um, I'd prefer it to stay there. I think as we most were saying, yes, it's perfectly healthy there. It's one of the healthiest looking palms I could see and it's holding the bank together. It's performing its duty and it's unbelievably beautiful at sunset. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Councillor Kira from Councillor Sims. Thanks, Chair. Um, look, it doesn't have to be 
removed. Um, it doesn't have to be replaced. Doesn't have to be. Doesn't have to go anywhere. So there's look. Th there's one tree here. Uh, the rest of the canary date palms um, have been removed as part of this um, program. This one tree is adjacent to the bridge. Um, I think we ought to. I think we ought to retain the tree full stop. Uh, there is no reason whatsoever that you cannot have one canary date palm at the juncture of the road and then not have a continuous river red gum environment. I say to councillors, uh, those of you who may have had uh, may have uh, had to deal with um, angry uh, constituents talking about uh, alleging that you're some kind of, you know, uh, ski mask wearing, chainsaw wielding, uh, tree murderer uh, in relation to North Terrace, you can say to them all, what we did do, <laughs> what we did do, what we did do is save the day palm along, and what we did do is save the day palm along uh, Frome Street. Um, keep in mind, this this day palm uh, grew naturally. Uh, so th th this tree grew naturally. It was actually dropped by a bird. It wasn't actually planted artificially. And the thing about that is that we're, we're being asked to believe that we, in order to have a natural river red gum environment, we can have no other species whatsoever. That doesn't occur in real life. Where you have river red gums occurring naturally, the same thing happens. You get other trees get dropped by birds. So it is not artificial to have a tree. Uh, in fact, it's quite perverse to suggest uh, that you should remove a tree artificially that grew naturally. So I, I think it is important. I think councillors this is no biggie. This is just one tree. We have um, allowed uh, the removal of all the other ones. It's just one tree. It makes a difference. It's a very pretty tree. Uh, it is somewhat iconic. It gives a certain charm and atmosphere. It will not, it will not harm the uh, river red gum environment that is uh, that can easily flourish without the one tree. There'll be acres and acres of them. So I said, actually, to that end, I would actually add uh, an amendment to uh, the amendment, uh, and that is that uh, uh, instead of number two, um, that council retains that tree, um, retains that tree and plants, uh, retains that tree and continues with its river red grum program, uh, you know, apart from it or around it, something like that. Instead of planting additional trees, is that what's happening? Yeah. That happening? I think it's what's happening. Yeah. No, 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 we're removing this tree, are we? No. Yeah, yeah. we do not approve it. And that means okay. it remains. Well, all right. Okay. Well, scotch, scotch that then. Uh, don't worry about that. If we're going to keep the tree with this with this amendment, then that's uh, I support the amendment. Thank you, Councillor Kerry. Councillor Sibbs. Thank you. So I support this um, variation um, as well. Um, you know, look, I, I never want to want to uh, remove healthy trees. Um, and uh, if this tree has still got um, a life to go, I, I don't want to see um, it removed. I do disagree with Councillor Kira on one point, though. It doesn't absolve councillors from their decision on North Terrace. Um, you won't be off the hook over that one. Um, but I do um, encourage you to support um, retaining this tree. Do we have any other speakers? I might just request some clarification from administration, just if there would be any uh, unforeseen issues with this amendment that may not have been contemplated in the report, but you haven't yet spoken to it. The report's quite clear. I don't think there's anything that we haven't presented previously. <laughs> Understood. Councillor Don much as I hate to see the removal of a perfectly healthy tree, I don't support the amendment because it's not in alignment with the intention of the riparian zone and it does have impacts on, as has been explained to us uh, in previous reports and in great depth, and it's a horrendous shame that it can't be relocated as was suggested. Um, but the reality is, as we know, uh, date Palms, the what they drop and the environment that they will uh, that they will hinder essentially by um, by changing this one area of the of the riparian zone. It does have a consequence. It is probably minor in the scheme of things, but in the intent of the biodiversity uh, plan that we have approved or the previous councils have approved, um, I will support the initial intent and therefore not support the report. Thank you. Do we have any other speakers before I go to Councillor Martin to sum up? Councillor Abbey. Thank you. Um, look, I, um, I was, Councillor Kira sort of won me over, and then Councillor Donovan 
um, kind of took me back. <laughs> um, it's a look. It's a it's a real it's a it's a real tough one for me. Um, look, I'm I'm going to hear Councillor Martin in summing up. This is look either way. This is going to be a good outcome, I think, at the end. Uh, but look, the reality is, if if there are people that are absolutely passionate about this single tree that needs to be there, provided that doesn't have an impact. Uh, on the surrounding vegetation and what we're trying to achieve, then that's okay. But I'm going to see if Councillor Martin can convince me otherwise. Oh, you're in trouble, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. I, mean, I, I might just make a couple of comments before I pass to Councillor Martin to sum up. And, and I would just highlight it was Councillor Aviad that just referred to projects of passion that Council might want to contribute uh, or, or contemplate. Um, this is one project of passion that I will be supporting, the retention of this tree. Um, and at least this project uh, is one that's free to implement. So I'll pass to Councillor Martin to sum up. Uh, look, I, can I just in conclusion say that, I, look, I support the, the policy. The, the policy um, is a perfectly good policy. However, this is a perfectly good tree. It is not going to do any harm to allow this thing to finish its life and for that feature of the landscape to remain. And let me just say, I, I don't see, I, I have no reason uh, to doubt that different species of trees can live well in harmony. This morning, I was in the Bel Air National Park, which is full of uh, uh, eucalypts, but also introduced species living side by side, oaks. Uh, there are a couple of pines, believe it or not. Uh, and no one is suggesting that we go into the National Park with a chainsaw and remove all of those trees which don't actually sustain the gums that are there. They are existing happily together and are enjoyed by everybody who sees them. Um, this tree, this palm, is perfectly healthy. It has come to be known by everybody who lives in Adelaide for its location, its majesty. Please just leave the bloody thing alone. You got me on the bloody. Thank you. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? It's carried. We now move to item 5.3, the Prospect Road Parklands Entry Improvements and Tree Removal. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please? <laughs> Moved by Councillor Martin. Uh, an alternate motion. Mm -hmm. Has it been circulated beforehand? Yep. Um, uh, no, no, no. No, no. Okay, please walk us through. Just talking to Councillor Moran a moment ago, we were both agreeing. Again, a little chest. Not something we support. So, well, that's correct. That's not true. <laughs> um, and Do I have a second of this? No, hang on, I have a bit more. And then. Um, um, the second part finishes at Prospect Road. First mention of full stop. Second to this, Councillor Sims, Councillor Martin. Well, look, uh, just very briefly, it's the same principle. Um, I, I'm sure other members did so. I went out there and I had a look today um, and um, they are perfectly healthy trees. Now, some of them are small, I, I grant you that, some of them are small um, and it does look a bit bushy and scrubby around there um, but I cannot conceive of a reason for removing them uh, sure, the footpath could be wider, but it's certainly adequate for um, the couple that I saw with the pram on there today when I was visiting. Uh, if it accommodates that kind of width, that's fine. And I, look, I don't disagree with this, uh, I don't agree rather, with this new concept that's uh, described for us at pages 60 and 61 as a justification. Um, that is uh, the necessity to remove hiding spots. And this is a new concept, uh, new hiding spots. Um, well, it, it may well be uh, a hiding spot if it was near a house, but it's not. And uh, I still don't understand what it's a hiding spot. Is it Easter eggs or uh, drugs or 
uh, people. It, it's not clear, it doesn't say. It just says it's a hiding spot. And it wasn't apparent to me that you could hide much there at all. Uh, certainly an Easter egg, it, it would be quite visible from the footpath. <laughs> And, and moreover, if we adopt this class of menace as a policy that is hiding spot, um, where will it end? Uh, we will be pulling shrubs from every street in the city. Um, this is just a piece of parkland. It is scrubby and bushy, and by its nature, it's scrubby and bushy. It is perfectly fine. And around this can be constructed with ease and with minimal damage, I would have thought, the footpath that's envisaged in the plan for part two for the uh, prospect entry statement, um, the enhanced daytime parking, which I know does not operate uh, uh, of a morning at this time, uh, and uh, the, uh, the general upgrade that's required. Um, now, I note that nothing has been presented to us for the other side, although there's something shown on the plan, whether that means there'll be a plan later on to demolish the trees on the other side and replant there as well, I don't know. But um, the other side is perfectly attractive as well. It is parkland. It is meant to look scrubby. There is no reason for us to go in there with a chainsaw. We can accommodate the redevelopment for the Prospect Council, funded by the state government, at Park 3, by simply leaving these trees there for everyone to continue to enjoy without planting, as is envisaged in the illustrations, uh, trees in a uniform pattern, uniform space, and a uniform look. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Uh, yes, I um, support this motion, obviously. I don't support the removal of um, healthy trees. trees. Um, you know, it seems their only crime is being a hiding spot. Um, which disturbs me somewhat if we're going to start um, viewing trees in that way, um, reflects a rather peculiar world view. But I also think um, there's a really important principle here that we don't chop down healthy trees to make way for another car park. I mean, what sort of principle and what sort of message are we sending to our community when we start removing trees to improve entry points and um, to accommodate more car parking? I mean, I, I don't think um, that's a, a sensible um, principle. I take um, Councillor Martin's um, point about the standardisation and this idea that we have to have uniform trees. I think that's actually in keeping with the broader McDonaldization of society that says that everything needs to be uniform. We can't have trees on North Terrace that are a bit messy or a bit, you know, overhanging. Um, we've got to make everything look the same and have this sort of cookie cutter design. Um, and I don't think that's the appropriate um, approach to take to our public space, particularly our parklands. Um, so I'd urge councillors to support this motion. In particular, um, through you, Chair, I'd expect Councillor Kira to um, support this, given um, the strong position that he has taken on the previous motion, because it is a consistent position. Just pass to the CEO for clarity on the car park. It's very I just want to seek administration to clarify this statement that this um, removal of trees would be for car parking. Can you just clarify the actual need for, physical need for removal, thanks? Uh, through you, Chair. Uh, just uh, if I could just clarify, the actual requirement for space is for the entirety of the design. So it's not considering an individual element. It's the entirety of the space required. So that includes the road corridor. It also includes the ability to plant the trees. Uh, and, I and I take it, yes, in a uniform pattern, as well as creating what we call a shared use path. So this is to facilitate a safe movement of cyclists and pedestrians. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Abia. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Look, uh, in, this, um, in this instinct, I will not be supporting the um, alternate uh, recommendation put by Councillor Martin to the room. Look, we are not talking about trees. We are talking about bushes. Um, we're talking about a lot of small bushes in that case as well, um, and smaller trees um, in, that, in that sense. Um, we are talking about a significant piece of development that's going to be connecting two cities together. Um, which will have a requirement around public realm access. These are non-significant, they're small, 
Um, and we've heard from administration just now to why the need for this. I think it's really important um, for myself and for elected members as well. I always think it feels like this is always the first resort that our administration does. They come to us wanting to chop trees down. But matter of fact, it's always meant to be the last resort. Um, and that is that is where things come. So I'm sure for them to come to us with this decision, that there was another, uh, there was no alternate outcome, but this outcome for them to recommend. So with that in mind, I will flag that I'm happy to move the previous uh, recommendation of council as noted by the administration to committee if this uh, alternate one was to fail. Thank you. Councillor Moran. Uh, yes, look, we do have a policy to uh, minimise minimise um, hiding areas, but it's only um, in residential streets um, that, like Barton Terrace West, um, we've done at Barton Terrace East. In front of my house on Mills Terrace, we took out some shrubby little things. But this isn't the case in here. We're on a busy road. Who's going to, what are you going to burgle, hijack a car or something? Um, I think the long term plan is it, it, this is to increase car parking for the aquatic centre takeover. Um, I don't think you need to be too much of a conspiracy theorist to see that. Um, so I naturally <coughs> against that. I, I don't think that. If this administration wanted to neaten this up, that's part of their normal um, gardening um, regime. But obviously that it's come to us, it's, it's much more than that. This is a wholesale removal of trees and they, they are trees, they're bushy trees, some of them are tree trees. Um, and they could be pruned up. What they did in Barton Terrace West was just take off the lower branches so there was visibility through uh, and that this could be done here. I agree it needs to be tidied up. But our go-to position seems to rip out and start again. And I think that's, a um, well, you can see that maybe this could be more attractive. That is a really bad way to operate. And I think that's what's operating now. Clear the whole thing and start again. Let's just fix up and neaten up and do some tree husbandry. Thank you, Councillor Donovan and Councillor Corus and then the Lord. Thank you. Uh, once again, surprisingly, I um, do not uh, support the amendment. I do support the removal of the trees because it provides a beautiful separated pathway. Um, and I would really just hope that when this, the more detailed design is done for the separated pathway, uh, that it's adequate in width because it is a shared path. And uh, we know that they don't work in all scenarios. So to ensure that when that width is, is created, that we do the details ensuring that it's the right width for it to be an effective separated bikeway. The picture looks lovely. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I will not support the amendment. Councillor Gross and the Lord Mayor. I too do not support the amendment. I love the conspiracy theories, but this is actually providing um, something else to this corridor and it's providing the ability to people to be able to um, bike uh, comfortably throughout from going through one council area to another council area. And this is what this is for. We've also got, uh, you know, we're redoing the um, tennis courts, which is also we're doing a barbecue area in there. We're um, creating it more inviting for the public to come and uh, to cycle there and uh, walk in, in this area um, quite efficiently. Um, the trees that are in question here are just shrubs. Um, you know, we're not significant trees here. Um, we, if you actually walk through that area, you actually can't. You can't even walk through it at all. So um, I don't understand what the um, the deal is here on, on the, the thoughts on the other side because you can't even run across that parkway. You can't ride your bike. You can't walk efficiently at all. So this is a major thoroughfare. It is a gateway. It's the gateway into the north. We, we want it to look inviting. We don't want it to look the way it is at the moment. I think this is a fantastic um, way forward uh, to clean it up, bring people to cycle through the area um, and uh, yeah, for the, public, for the community to use. And uh, you know, I think this has been in the making for quite some time. It's been on the books to be done um, for quite some time. So I don't think it's something new. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, can I just ask a couple of questions? Is there any new parking that's been put in? Is, is there parking currently? There is current parking availability in terms of space. How it operates is that it's a, a clear one. 
Um, so this this design is proposing that it's line mark to formalise that availability of parking. In terms of the, there's a couple of ways to look at it so that it is becoming more available, but there is a reduction in the entirety of that area to park within by the um, by the fact that we're planting trees within the road corridor. So there's 32 metres of linear length reduced from that availability, but it is available for however we want to operate in that space. Thank you. Um, and look, I do agree it's been um, two and a half years, if not longer, in the making. Um, I don't support the amendment. And just as we actually invested into Sir Donald Bradman uh, as the entry from the west, this is the entry from the north and we will eventually get to the entry from the east and the entry from the, the south. So um, so we actually want to beautify our city and I think this goes a long way to it. The shared path will be great, it will be lit, it will be wide enough and this will give us a great entry statement into the city. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? Councillor Martin, to sum up? Yes, I'd like to ask a couple of questions in accordance with the principle yes. that was established earlier. Um, and I have to say that the information in the report isn't apparent to me. So, is there to be any change to the roadway at all? Uh, the, the changes are to the uh, line marking. So there is um, currently the clear wind is, is uh, available as a third lane. Um, the operation in that space has been determined that it is suitable to introduce a third lane as you're travelling, leaving the city at, at about where the courts are. So it has a transition, hence the opportunity to formalise the parking in that section from the intersection up to that point. So the, the only change, as I understand it, you're saying is that the parking, which is currently prohibited between seven and nine, or 9.30, I can't remember, um, would disappear and it would be available for commuter parking or anyone for that matter all day long. Is that correct? That is correct. It would be up to Council how they see fit to have operations within that available car parking space. Okay. Um, and there is mention of a uh, bikeway or was discussion of a bikeway, a shared path. It's not mentioned in the papers. How wide is that shared path? Uh, the shared path will achieve the minimum two and a half metre width. And what's the current width of the footpath? It's uh, less, but it certainly doesn't achieve two and a half. About half a metre short, I, I would have thought. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no we think it's, I think it's less than that. I saw two people side by side on it today. One with a pram, that was just two minutes. But look, all right, I'll accept that. Um, and what about the other side? Because the illustration is showing us that the same treatment would apply to the other side. That is to say, um, there is this long uniform row of trees. Is that going to come to council as well? Uh, the Everything that you see in the extent of that concept is the extent of all of the changes in that space. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that there's nothing else in terms of the design to be revealed, so to speak. So that, that concept is entire, the entirety of the proposed change. Okay. Oh, and just one quick thing about the bikeway. Uh, which bikeways does that connect to uh, south of that street and north of the street? I'd need to take that on notice to confirm what happens, particularly into Prospect. Okay, well look, I think I can help you. There is no bikeway at Prospect. The, in, the entrance is through Braun Street. Prospect is just painted line markings. And it is Councillor the same. Martin, are you asking a question or are you summing up? Oh no, I'm just helping. I'm sorry. I, I'm happy to sum up. Um, look, um, this is um, a $3 million budget uh, that is primarily being spent on the tennis courts and the barbecue. Um, this that you're being asked to approve here is a minimal extension of the path which could probably occur anyway without destruction of the trees. Um, uh, to dismiss them as shrubs um, is naive um, and to suggest that somehow by demolishing these uh, 17 trees will somehow open up the park 
is also a nonsense because the scrub uh, persists further back into the park. That is the charm of Mark III. It is scrubby. Uh, it has a, a playing area of sorts in the middle, um, but it is part of that last remnants of what looks like parklands that are natural and not manicured. Now, if you accept the concept that all parklands need to have manicured edges, um, uh, a manicured address, I think, was what we used to call it in the old days when the debates came up here in council, then sure, vote for this. But there is no need for these trees to be removed. Everything can proceed um, as it is, and the line markings can occur to provide all day parking, whether it's for the aquatic centre, for commuters or whatever. All of those things can occur, including a shared bikeway uh, that doesn't connect with anything. Um, but there's just absolutely no reason to remove these healthy trees. Put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That is lost. Um, we'll now move back to the original recommendation. And I see a mover and a seconder, Councillor Kuros, seconded by Councillor Abia. Councillor Kuros, do you wish to speak? Councillor Abia. Are there any other speakers? Councillor Kuros, to sum up. I put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? I declare that carried. Moving on to item 5.4, the Chinatown and Market District Safety uh, Report. I seek a mover for the report. Councillor Ho. Seconder, Councillor Abiyad. Councillor Ho, do you wish to speak? We said my right. Councillor Abiyad. We said my right, Chair, thanks. Are there any other speakers? Councillor Sims. I'd like to ask some questions and then I um, will move an amendment. Certainly. Firstly, um, I'd like to ask some questions about the uh, video surveillance equipment that's been proposed here. Are there any restrictions on the equipment that company, uh, the equipment um, that businesses can use in terms of particular companies or providers? Uh, through the chair, we haven't yet looked at the restrictions on what type, but we just looked at what's out in the market but well, the next phase of that would be to go and look at what are the suitable products so there's no particular stipulation being given around saying you can't use any particular companies or anything like that yeah i think sorry to, to clarify the um the proposal that we've put up is to i guess get council support for the proposal the concept and then the right. next three months would be spent in doing our due diligence around how it would work all of the eligibility criteria so um and with a vision for it to be rolled out in q4 i guess it's difficult to agree with the concept when some of those broader questions are unknown. I guess for me, one of the things I'm concerned about is who exactly would have access to the footage. So what happens to it when it's collected by the, the business? I mean, I know there are parts of the city that are already monitored through Sayhole, but what would happen in this instance? So the private business takes the footage and where does it go? So there's many businesses at the moment that have private CCTV, so it's their responsibility to manage that footage under the relevant legislation. So that would be our approach. But could we be assured that it wouldn't be shared externally? No. No. No, we just have to rely on what the existing regime. Yeah. Um, Look, I'll move um, my... Uh, sorry, I'll just, I'll just bump in Councillor Sims. Uh, Councillor Ho, I just wanted to clarify that you wanted to move the recommendation along with point six. Yes. Yes. Uh, Councillor Abiyad, is that amenable to you as well? Okay, understood. Please continue, Councillor Sims. Um, I'd like to move the uh, amendment which I circulated um, earlier today. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, point six, sorry, I wasn't aware of that one. Could you pull that up? I'm happy to maybe yeah, incorporate that. that. Okay, look, I don't have a problem adding Do we that. I think that that I'll grab that. Yeah, that, that's fine. We agree that. Yeah, thank you. And uh, can I get a seconder for this amendment? 
for the sake of the debate. Councillor Martin. Thank you. Councillor Simpson. Thank you. Thank you. Look, um, I take administration's point that you're going, you're asking for approval for the broad concept first, and then you're going to um, deal with the um, specifics in terms of how it may work down the track. But for me, I, I find this concept quite um, disturbing. I mean, I, I understand by that, I mean, the, the concept of surveillance uh, being undertaken by private business. I understand that obviously parts of the city are already monitored by SAPOL, but to actually have a, um, a scheme whereby you encourage private businesses to undertake the surveillance, I think is a very different thing because there isn't the same level of control as would occur when you have a SAPOL running the service. Um, so for me, that does raise real concerns around privacy, what happens to um, the information that is um, being gathered. I did a bit of um, investigation prior to the meeting today and um, found a, a report that had been done uh, by an academic who's an expert in the area, uh, Prenzler, who did a report, Private Security in Australia Trends and Key uh, Characteristics. One of the things that he identified, and I will just read a brief excerpt because I think it's quite relevant to the debate we're having. And he said, the convergence of surveillance technology among state, private and hybrid policing systems poses major problems in terms of both criminal justice and civil rights. Work practices, hardware management and data management strategies are dispersed and not subject to any comprehensive quality control. The relationships between state and private security personnel raise major concerns, including, da including data misuse. And for me, that's the fundamental point here. We know what happens with SAPOL because they have their own processes in place. But when we're partnering with private business and asking them to, in effect, survey the public realm, I think that's a very different thing. So I'm concerned about this and I'm not keen for us to go down um, this uh, path. Sorry, I can see Deputy CEO. Yes. Maybe I'll finish my comments okay. and then if you want to respond. Um, I guess the other concern I have, um, aside from the civil liberties issues and issues around the data, is also around what I consider to be a fairly poor um, evidence base for um, this response. Um, I looked at some of the, the heat mapping or whatever term you would use looking at safety. It seems to be that the area is actually pretty safe. Um, a lot of the concerns that seem to be uh, documented relate to um, what is deemed antisocial behaviour, in particular the consequences of poverty in our city. I mean, there are people complaining about begging. I mean, begging is not a criminal issue um, and it certainly shouldn't be regarded um, as one. If we want to address begging, then we need to actually put more support into social housing and dealing with those broader social issues. So what concerns me is that what we're asking is a significant infringement on um, just one minute more. Can I go to Thank you. Thanks. What we're asking for is a significant infringement on personal liberties, potentially, um, to deal with a problem that, from what I can see, doesn't really exist. Um, so I, I don't think this is the right approach. I'm happy to support increased lighting, happy to talk to SAPOL about other supports, but to be rolling out an expansion of surveillance on the streets seems like a real overkill to me. Thank you. I'll ask if the administration do wish to make some comments. Thank you. I just want to clarify that the rollout of the CCTV rebate scheme would be on private property within private businesses. So but it would be monitoring the footpath out the front because it says the that in the... adjoining footpath, but from yeah. the private business, yes. Yeah, but it's designed to monitor the public realm. That's a condition of the requirement. Thank you. Did uh, yeah. seconder wish to speak? Reserve Councillor Martin. Was taken out the yeah. Thank you, Chair. Look, um, I, um, I speak against um, this um, alternate recommendation for a, a couple of reasons. Uh, one, um, look, I, I do implore Councillor Sims, um, I can understand the civil liberty focus, I guess, as part of the debate, but there are people walking around with mobile phones filming absolutely everything everywhere. Um, this, is a, this is a safety issue, this is a security issue. Um, and it would be very important if he has the time to actually visit some of those businesses that have been impacted in the area, because this has been a, a rise of significant piece of work that Councillor uh, Hose led um, with the police, where they've engaged those businesses specifically. And I think what we've ended up with is a, is a not bad outcome in comparison to what we ended up with, for example, on Hutt Street, where council had to 
for bill for a significant amount of cost for security where these businesses are concerned about their own properties, they're concerned about theft, they're concerned about damage. And if there is some type of a scheme which will be developed over the next three months that can assist uh, those traders to overcome those risks and manage it better, be it that, in your opinion, it may be a, a perception, but the fact remains that if you speak to them, uh, they are the ones on the street uh, constantly and they're the ones that have been impacted and they're telling us that they're impacted. Um, so look for what this is cost-wise in comparison to what um, I would imagine uh, it would cost council. I think the cost for council at 50 or so K would be potentially, um, that's like two cameras, <laughs> I think, or something like that. It's something ridiculous, the cost that was on Hut Street from, from memory. So look, if the businesses can benefit from this, if they're using it within their premises to be able to determine, um, uh, you know, who's breaking in or not breaking in or to deter people from doing um, any criminal activities in the area. Uh, the fact that there is, uh, you know, front page news today about it, I think will be acting as a deterrence for people to also do the wrong thing in the area. So, um, look, I think all those things are, uh, are positive. So uh, if the traders are happy and if they're not impacted and if this is what council can do to assist, then I'm, I'm happy to support the motion that I've seconded initially and I'll ask members to uh, to not support this current uh, recommendation or this alternate recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Ho, then Councillor Moran, then Councillor Donald. Thank you, Chair. Firstly, I'd like to ask two questions, if possible. Uh, first one, are you aware any of the private business already have cameras installed in their premises and have the camera monitor the, 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 the public room? Um, through you, uh, I, I am aware that they do have cameras in, in their business already. Um, I'm not aware whether they monitor the front. Okay. Second question, have you ever received any reports about those private business use the CCTV footage for any wrongdoings? Uh, no, I'm not going to Right, thank you. <coughs> uh, Chair, I'd like to speak I'd like to speak again is the, the amendment on this motion. Well in the I am very, very disappointed that when I received the email from Councillor Sims today about the amendment. Over the last couple of weeks, I have been heavily engaged with the community. Indeed, I try to join all of them into the same WeChat group. And I work, I spent a lot of time to work with the administration. And I work together with the SA police as well as our administration on the street, a couple of hours on the street, knock on the door, one by one. It doesn't matter who they are, what, where they come from. We knock on the door one by one and ask for the, for their concerns, ask them for their suggestions. And the administration do it in the daytime and they come back to do it in the nighttime. These are the direct feedbacks from our community. It is disappointed that like Councillor Sims have not spent one second work with the administration, have not spent one second with SA police, and come have not with any of the traders and ask, ask what they want. Understand, Councillor Moran, I do speak this with anger. I am very, yeah, very sorry, disappointed. Chair, not to first. Sorry. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so, after so many hours of work from SA police, elected members, as well as council administrations, and about 150 traders together in the area, now we have a solution. We have a solution that perfect, perfectly acceptable by the community. And Jesus, sorry, um, I need to calm down a little bit myself. It is disappointing to see that you have no, I mean, council seems have no engagements or contributions within the whole process and come back to try to damage the hard work other people have put in. Enough is enough. Let's not play politics here. Let's just for the outcomes of the community. I, I am really, really disappointed. And besides that, besides that, the advertiser and in daily have got reports about the safety of this thing. And I think we have got enough reports about this matter. Just leave the precinct quiet and let people enjoy it. 
we don't need to get headlines. Let's just get the outcomes for the community. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Yeah, well, that's a bit rich, seeing uh, I think you may have got the headlines. Um, and I'm very glad, uh, Councillor Ho, that it's not 50 million as you were quoted in the, on the no. radio as saying. I was wondering what sort of cameras you're getting. Hutt Street is quite different. Um, Hutt Street was expensive because we had a trench and they were also police monitored um, CCTVs for the public realm. So it's, it's apples and oranges there. Uh, look, I, I will vote for the original motion, but I hope that the move perhaps incorporates the number four as well that Councillor Sims has. And I think the rhetoric here from Councillor Ho is ridiculous. Um, I have know every trader there too, having been chair of the market for, for many a year with uh, Franz as my trader representative. I know them. We spoke to George Chin. I spoke to George Chin and he was unaware of any increase in um, serious increase. The maps that's here. Not true. That's what he said in the paper, and that's what he said. Councillors, please. The map. The maps here uh, show green and pale green is safe and very safe. Now, I am quite sure that anecdotally there have been snatches. I've actually seen a purse snatch in the food hall, but compared to Hutt Street, compared to Harney Street. It is not such a dangerous street. And I think the deterrent really is, Simon, when you say that it's a deterrent for thieves, it's actually a deterrent for people going there, the shooting in Goodger Street. I think it's also odd that we're starting to call Goodger Street Chinatown. That must annoy the, uh, the other ethnic restaurants. Um, I'm happy to have a rebate there, but it really is because um, I think CCTV, remember these are not monitored by the police. These are just little returning loops that that come into play afterwards. They're not much of a deterrent for thieves. All they have to do is put their hoodie up. Um, but if, if the traders there want a bit of a help buying them, they're not very expensive. 3,000 was quoted here, but you can get them for a lot less than that. Um, I think it's, a, it's virtue signaling. It's a nice thing to do. But I think the best thing we can do for Chinatown is repave the terrible paving that we put there before um, and put some lighting. I think CCTV cameras really are up to the trader. The police have said there is no crime way, there is no increase in crime here, it's a low crime area. However, I will vote against this and vote for yours. But I think to denigrate other councillors, I know count I know Chinatown just as well as you do. Thank you, Councillor Donovan, then Councillor Kouros, then Councillor Martin. Just a question. Um, at point 19, it says that the scheme if approved will be further developed. Uh, for implementation by the end of the financial year, and if successful, may be used as a model for other main streets. How are we defining success? Uh, so we said that's a good question. We haven't determined that yet. That'll be part of the next three months determining what success will look like. But um, I guess one of the key um, the key measures would be whether people have taken us up on the rebate scheme. So um, if that would be a key measure, if, if businesses don't take us up on it or, or it's not interested, um, that would be that would be one. But we'd use the next three months to come up with some with some more detailed measures. I I'm a bit torn on this one. I mean I think that when you look through the report as indicated uh, the, in comparison to other areas, the, the, the uh, crime statistics have not varied significantly. The perceptions of safety as re in the report are safe or very safe are very much here. Councillor Ho's um, experience of having gone around and spoken to the traders, so some of the, the perceptions versus what's being reported, it's very important information and something that we should listen to. Um, but when we look at whether we spend $50,000 here and then we expand it to the rest of the city and then we look at what that might look like over um, future forecasts, I don't see any evidence that this is going to be um, a positive contribution to reducing crime in comparison to some of the other ways that we may choose to spend that funding. $50,000 is a relatively small amount, but it would grow if it is taken up. So I would want to only approve the initial motion of the $50,000 in terms of the trial if success was defined well beyond just uptake of the equipment, but if it had some um, outcome measure that related specifically to um, crime, uh, whatever that may be, and without actually putting that into the, uh, into the motion, could we have some assurance that that could be included? So if I could just comment, Chair, um, we do um, get
get uh, customer um, satisfaction around how safe they feel in the city. So we um, can certainly use that data to track over time how people generally are feeling when they're in the city. Um, and the two pieces of feedback that are consistent, it's one around um, lighting and the need for um, lighting that enables people to feel safe. Um, and I think the other piece is just around visibility of sight lines as well. So we do, we can sort of track data. Mm. Yep, so to all of those points, I appreciate that this endpoint has um, been arrived at through mm -hmm. consultation with traders and with SAFOL and in consultation with SAFOL today, they did say they were in support of this, um, of the initial motion in terms of uh, the subsidy. Um, so with some uh, hesitation, I would support the initial motion for the equipment, but ensuring that we do like, some sort of assessment to define what success is that's beyond just the uptake. Thank you. Did you wish to respond to that? Yeah, so further to that, um, today, Sable did um, provide um, advice that they use the footage from private um, CCTV cameras every day. And so in addition to the uh, data that we might be able to get around deterring crime, um, we can certainly get um, data on the use of um, the footage after the crime has occurred. So that could be another measure that we could include. Thank you. Apologies, I neglected Councillor Canole. Who wish to speak, and followed by Councillor Kouros and then Councillor Lyle. Thank you, DLM. Um, now, uh, just as a, as a few points, I suppose, uh, as a question first, um, this uh, trial is, is about when we're talking about the traders, it is a one for one. I take it we're, we're providing $50,000 and they're, going, uh, it is, they're investing a similar sum of money as a trader. Is that correct? Yes, it's a matched funding. Okay, that's what I thought. That's one of the concerns I had previously, but, um, and I thought, well, that's a, that's a reasonable, um, you know, compromise to to achieve, you know, a good outcome. I mean, the cameras. If you think about it, we looked. We've talked about uh, certainly, uh, you know, privacy and things like that. Those those considerations are really important. But if you take it the other way, uh, these cameras, because they're not uh, monitored, they have very limited use, and we use uh, we use significant uh, cameras in, in our facilities, etc., and for all, all so sort of safety purposes and things like that. And and I mean, so it, it does take a lot of effort to to uh, uh, you know acquire the, the, the footage for any purpose. And, but it's, it, I can't imagine it being something uh, that will deliver anybody any advantage or anything like that, simply because it, it's, it's just simple uh, you know, video of, of uh, space. Um, but if you look back, and, uh, and it happens quite often uh, when you see the newspaper reports and obviously on, on TV, how uh, these snippets uh, are linked together for major crimes. And that's when you, see, you start putting it together for a purpose. And it isn't about identifying an individual, but it is identifying, um, you know, opportunities where, uh, you know, with I think uh, through Cor was it uh, with Corby there that uh, they're, they're able to track her movements and the and her assailant. Um, those sort of things can happen. I think I don't know if it's quite. It's one of them in Melbourne, you know, where you know they could attract the, the the two movements and they were able to narrow it down. And that's just by using these snippets of information. And I think that's important. I think because ultimately, um, you know, it may not be in the first instance uh, in real time, but it does help to uh, uh, capture uh, people when necessary, but also as a deterrent. And within the business, it's quite useful also. And I think uh, those sorts of things it does mean that it, it can be uh, helpful. And I suppose the community there has expressed uh, a great concern. And I think those sort of things, it's, it is about their comfort as well. And they are our rate payers and, and uh, it does help them to uh, feel that their precinct is safe. And also that we are doing something on their behalf as well. And uh, we as a council uh, need to ensure that our streets and with the lighting and all that attached with that as well, we've got a lot going on that will assist them. And I think, uh, and, and I suppose, uh, assist in, in making that precinct a much a much more, uh, you know, a com comfortable sort of environment, but also with the lighting and that, we're able to do a lot more and, and uh, make it a bit more vibrant at night as well. Thank you, Councillor Kouros, followed by Councillor Martin. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just, uh, would like to say that I won't be supporting this. Um, I will be supporting um, Councillor's initial motion. Um, as he 
Councillor Mahone knows the street, spoke with passion, and I'm going to trust what he's saying um, is, is what the traders want and what the precinct wants. Um, the businesses need to feel supported, and if this is what they need to feel supported, then that then why not? Um, if they're feeling that they need um, some extra um, surveillance in the area, then that is what they need. Then we are, as a council, need to listen to them and to uh, hear what they have to say. I mean, I don't think there's anything different than anyone having a camera outside in their, in their house when they take the you know footage outside of the public realm. Um, but uh, you know, I would like to think that um, we are following what our ratepayers want. And if this is what they're asking, if this is what Councillor Ho is saying that they're asking, then why not support that? So I won't be supporting this amendment. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Um, yeah, look, I second this, and I, I, I just want to flag that I won't, I won't be uh, voting for it. Uh, I do support absolutely, though, uh, Councillor Sims's right to raise issues around civil liberties. They are not offensive. Uh, it is a reasonable argument, and it was put in a reasonable way. Um, uh, fundamentally, I don't have a problem uh, with these cameras, uh, but I do have a problem with the way the debate has been argued. I mean, this is an issue not about crime prevention, it is about addressing the perceptions of a number of traders that there is a crime wave in Chinatown, which is not endorsed by police statistics, nor indeed by the conversation. Indeed, we met the senior officers today and they considered the problem in Chinatown is basically one individual. Uh, but there is a perception problem. And if uh, traders believe that they will be able to address their concerns with the subsidy from council, then that's fine. But all they'll have is great pictures of whoever it is who just robbed them or murdered them. That is essentially all we're doing. Um, and the second thing to all of this is, and, and I, I do think it's a, it's a lesson that we need to consider. Um, the issue has now been so well aired, so discussed in media, that it is going to take some time for the perception in the broader community that somehow Chinatown is dangerous for, for, for it to disappear. That, that is the consequence of these discussions. There is a broader understanding in the community, right or wrong, that there is a criminal element at work in Chinatown and it might not be a good idea to go there. That is a really, really bad thing that uh, is a consequence of all of this. But look, I won't support this. I'll support uh, Councillor Ho in the original uh, motion. Um, but, you know, look, let's not do this again for any part of the city. These are discussions that can be held offline without a front page of the advertiser, without ABC interviews um, that impact, impact traders through declined, uh, de declining visits. That is, the, that is the consequence. Thank you, Councillor Martin. I'm not sure if Councillor Hill intended to nab the front page, but no, doing so, I guess. I, if, there are, if there are no other speakers, I'll just make a couple of comments before I pass to Councillor Sims to sum up. Um, uh, I just make some comments. I do appreciate uh, the argument that perhaps it is a little bit more Orwellian to go down the citywide surveillance route. Of course, it's not something we want to do, um, uh, but sometimes it's something we have to do. But I would also make the comment that um, uh, if, if you want to think about misuse, potential misuse of, of footage, um, having a government have hold of all of that footage um, uh, as opposed to the decentralised model, which is what we're sort of looking at here, is probably more dangerous. So in, in actual fact, by decentralising where all that footage is um, uh, and, and allowing businesses to monitor inside their business as well, which is the other component of what we're doing here, um, uh, I think that's uh, that really addresses the concerns you're talking about. On uh, what Councillor Donovan spoke about, which is how we were actually measuring success, I do agree it is difficult to measure success and of course we might already be looking at the situation where uh, people are um, already deterred about committing crime potentially in Chinatown because of the front page of the paper or what have you. Um, so I do think that it might even be prudent to uh, trial not just in one area that's had a lot of publicity but potentially in another area as well when you want to measure success um, uh, you don't just look at a test case in one spot um, you actually look at uh, two or more spots when you're when you're seeing if something is actually going to be successful um, so I think that 
that idea um, is worth considering as well. I will um, not be voting for this because I do think while the concerns are somewhat valid in principle, um, uh, we do need to address community safety in the area, um, which is an, an ongoing issue for residents of the southwest corner generally as well. And so with that, I'll pass to Councillor Sims to sum up. Thank you, uh, Chair. Look, um, obviously this uh, amendment is not going to um, be supported tonight. I think that's a shame because this is, a, I think, an important principle and one that does set a quite dangerous precedent, I think, for our city. The idea that we um, basically outsource uh, surveillance of the public realm to private businesses um, when we don't have the same level of control um, around ensuring what happens with that data, ensuring that it's monitored appropriately, I think is, is dangerous. Um, but I think also there's not a, a clear evidentiary basis for um, this decision. Um, and it seems to me that a bit of a moral panic is being whipped up about Guja Street. I um, actually live in the area. Um, I walk up and down Guja Street several times a week. Uh, I don't accept the um, the version that has been projected in the media. Um, it seems to me that um, there's a particular agenda here about trying to get uh, media headlines. Councillor Ho has often um, attacked me and described me as a politician. Well, he is a politician um, and uh, he's certainly demonstrated um, his desire to play the political game uh, this last week by making overblown claims that don't um, have a clear evidentiary basis. Now, um, I um, understand the concerns that people have around safety in our city, but I actually think the role of a um, elected member is not to fan the flames of anxiety, but to actually try and put the uh, concerns of the community um, and their minds at ease, and to rather than to stoke, um, stoke fears. And I worry that that's what we're doing here. And I worry that once we go down this path, we will have other streets in the city coming to us saying we want a similar scheme to be put in place and once the genie is out of the bottle i don't know how we can put it back in again so this isn't to me a sensible use of our funds um, it does raise serious uh, privacy implications that have not been thought through um, and i think it's going to set a disturbing precedent for how we manage the public realm Thank you. With that, I put that to the vote. All those in favour of the amended recommendation? All those opposed? Declare that lost. Uh, and now we will move back to the uh, original recommendation. Um, and if we can reach the step where we are. Oh, Councillor Ho, straight back to you. If you wish to uh, speak on your motion, sum up. Uh, not not some up you wish to speak on your motion. Originally you never you never took your, your right to speak. Can I just sum up? You no, no, no. You oh, reserve my right. All right. You reserve it again. Are there any other speakers who wish to contribute to this? Councillor Donovan? Can I add, can I add a variation at this stage to add in other precincts, South Terrace and Hart Street? To the um, trial? You may, if that's uh, if that's amenable to. So instead of it just being um, Chinatown, to add in both the trial to one of these on the South Terrace. Can we include that on the street and Street too? It should be fair. Make a citywide. Are you happy to make a citywide trial? Well, that's going to be a bit of butt blood. Councillors, please. Councillors, please. Do the whole lot. Do the whole lot. Um, councillors, the advice I've received is that, is that if we broaden it out too far from the original precinct, we're going to need yeah. another amendment and not and not a variation. You would have Oh, yeah. That's fine. We'll leave it. We'll do it at council. We'll leave it. We'll leave it at that. Okay. Are there any uh, other speakers on this uh, recommendation? There being none, I'll pass to Councillor Ho to sum up. Sum up. Thank you. I put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? Thank you. That was carried.
Um, now, councillors, I'm conscious of uh, what best practice is as far as decision making goes. Um, it's been suggested that we might have a short five minute break, considering we've been going for two and a half no, hours no, at this no, point. Um, I'll I'll put the question. Uh, are any could you could I please see a show of hands for those in favour of a short five minute adjournment? Those against? Okay, we adjourn for five minutes. Mm.
Come on, let's finish it. Okay, councillors, uh, we'll reopen the meeting. If you can all please take your seats now. Thank you. Okay, well, the meeting is resumed and we are up to item 5.5, City of Adelaide, a welcoming city. Uh, I'll seek a mover and a seconder for this. Councillor Abiyad moving, Councillor Ho seconding. Councillor Abiyad, do you wish to speak? Is that all right? Councillor Ho, do you wish to speak? Is my right? Are there any other speakers on this? There being none, I'll pass to Councillor Abiyad to sum up. Oh, no. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That item is carried. We now move to item 5.6, City Bikeways Funding Deed Revised Scope of Works. And I would just note, as this is highlighted by the circular earlier today, that there was a slight correction to the table which didn't add up, and also a clarification about the $1 million of funding to be allocated to the delivery of the North, South and East, West bikeways, um, diverted from uh, the previous feasibility state. So you can move it, Councillor Abiyad, second Lord Mayor. Councillor Abiyad, do you wish to speak? Was that what Lord Mayor, do you wish to speak? Any other speakers? Councillor Sims. Yes, yeah, thank you. Just a, um, a question for administration. I noted um, in the report here the, the reference to, um, and obviously this, this can happen without um, endorsement tonight, that the state government has proposed to extend the funding deed to 30th of June 2021. So when does that mean that we would begin work on the bikeway here in the City of Adelaide? Uh, through the Chair, could you just confirm which is this in the discussion section? Sorry, I've lost the um, page, but it's mentioned in administration's own report. Page 84.6. As a result, the State Government has proposed to extend the funding deed to 30th of June 2021. Uh, 2021, sorry. So I'm just asking, when would we actually start work on the project? Um, through the Chair, um, the funding deed is to extend that, the funding. Um, work is not contingent on the funding, if that makes sense. So provided um, there's been a commitment made to the construction of by that date, um, there are a number of impediments impacting our ability to complete the north-south bikeway at the moment, um, namely a number of construction projects on Frome Road. Um, the east-west bikeway is subject to council selecting a preferred um, a corridor for the east-west bikeway, so until such time um, as um, those construction sites are available so that those portions of the North-South Bikeway can be completed and subject to council actually resolving where uh, the corridor is for the east-west route uh, will de determine when construction can commence. So uh, it, it could happen potentially before 2021 if we got our act together? It certainly could, yes. C can I ask, um, I'm a bit confused by how what's happening on Frome Street impacts and the reference to the Adelaidean. I mean, how does that impact on the project? Um, through the Chair, uh, the Adelaidean development takes up uh, approximately 10 metres of the width of Frome Road, uh, which is literally bang slap in the middle of uh, the corridor of the north-south bikeway in that portion of Frome Road. So we can't actually construct a we couldn't work, we, there's no work around, there's nothing that could be happening or we couldn't be having discussions internally to try and resolve things. I mean, isn't the, the limit seems to be more imposed by the council in terms of confusion around where we want the bikeway to be. Uh, through the chair, the route for the north and south bikeway is settled. Uh, the issue is construction impeding um, the route um, within that section of Frome Road. Um, notwithstanding that, we are working with the developer, uh, the Samaras Group or the Karen Group, to um, ensure that uh, as soon as they are able to make that area available and clear, uh, we will uh, commence work with completing that section of the bikeway. Uh, there is a portion on the um, eastern side of Frome Road as well, uh, where there is an approval for a micro 
Red Tail, uh, a small site on the corner of North Terrace and Frome Street, and that is likely to impact on the um, on the eastern side of Frome Road as well. There's a bike share operator uh, mentioned in the report that are going to start in 2020. Are we are you able to shed some light on who they are? Uh, not yet. Okay. Stay tuned. <laughs> okay. Look. Um, Thank you. I guess I just wanted to use this opportunity to express my frustration um, around the uh, delays that we've seen on getting cycling infrastructure happening in the city. Um, I, I think the um, delays are um, not so much the result of external factors like construction, but more the result of um, decision making within this council. Um, and the delays um, within the elected body around um, reaching consensus and actually move forward, moving forward on this. Deputy Lord Mayor is shaking his head, but I mean this saga has order, been order. going on for about ten years. Order, order. I'm not the deputy Lord Mayor. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Apologies. I'm elevating you um, above your station, um, Hassan. Oh, oh. No, Let, yeah, yeah, yeah. Councillor, um, Councillor Abiad, you know, and, and all the other titles that you um, hold. Um, but look, um, I think there have been some missed opportunities along the road here. Um, I think you know we developed the Smart Move strategy what ten years ago through council, um, and since then it seems to have been followed not by smart moves but by a series of dumb moves, a lot of uh, backpedalling. Um, and missed opportunities in terms of getting things happening. Um, and I'm not criticising administration, I'm commenting on the elected members um, who I think have um, unfortunately missed opportunities to get cycling infrastructure happening in the city. So I really want to see this happen within this term of council. We need to get on with it. Um, I think the community is scratching their heads looking at this and saying, when on earth are we going to see this project completed? Um, and uh, I don't think as an elected body we can say the fault lies with external factors. The fault lies with the elected body for not prioritising um, bikeways appropriately and we really need to do so. So let's hope that 2020 is the year that we finally get things happening, we stop the backpedalling and we actually get some action on this. Please stop the puns as well, Councillor Donovan, <laughs> followed by Councillor Abia. Um, I look forward to the opportunity. This, of course, is no problem. We're simply removing something that's no longer particularly relevant. Uh, and uh, in terms of amending the extension of the funding deed that has a practical element, we need some more time because, unfortunately, the delays have been extensive. Um, we now need to focus on making a decision uh, on where the East West is going at our upcoming community, uh, upcoming council workshop, which I look forward to, because of course, once we put that decision in place, whichever street is the lucky recipient of our very first East West, one of many, uh, will increase an uplift in property values, will increase an increase, will experience an increase in retail expenditure. And of course, we will be providing huge cost savings to all of our residents who are able to utilise the network because we know typically the average Australian household spends somewhere between 25 to 30% of their household income on transport. So by unleashing those dollars, we will be saving our residents, we'll be saving our visitors. And of course, that means more discretionary spending in all of our local shops. So this is a win-win-win situation. And most importantly, we know that by getting this network in place, this next step of our network will be providing a significant boost to health and wellbeing outcomes. So I look forward to our imminent decision uh, in terms of which street will be the lucky first recipient in the east-west direction of that uh, expenditure for installing a separated bikeway. Councillor Abbeard, you're taking up your right to speak. Look, I am. I wasn't going to, but um, since you've allowed Chair for members to speak outside the scope of this motion, I will do so as well. Um, the reality is uh, we're debating here the removal of a point-to-point -point bike share scheme and then we suddenly got uh, brought into a whole debate around whether we support bikeways or not. Um, <laughs> the, the reality is, uh, firstly, the, uh, the south-north 
um, extension or supported by previous council, and that is currently locked and loaded to be delivered, awaiting a hotel to move its bollard from its current place to complete. Uh, this is not a political nightmare. This is the actual reality of where we're at. Council's committed to it and it connects to the times. We've spoken to the schools. We've done all that work. Council so far in the last, in this term, um, have moved as well to deal with two items to do with the bikeway. Um, the last of which council endorsed unanimously on the 9th of April, a motion moved by Councillor Donovan that actually committed the council to the east-west bikeway um, and uh, committed it to be on Peary Street. So I, uh, this, I'm sorry to use this word, this bullshit that's been peddled. No, um, language. Is a, apologies, I'll take that back. It's felt good to say it though. Um, <laughs> I'm not calling you more. Um, Councillors, so please let Councillor the reality, finish. The reality is uh, there is a council position on a clear path, which is at the moment looking at Peary Street. That is council's decision, just to remind elected members. And on Peary Street at the moment, there is significant development at play uh, that is going in the way of development. There's hotels, there's other construction sites that are being at play here. Uh, so having an extension uh, on that grant is something that I support um, and making sure that we are still committed to the delivery of this outcome is really important. So I'm not gonna accept um, the political badgering around that this council isn't committed to the project. The council is because it did support a motion brought by Councillor Donovan to actually go ahead and start preparing for the works on Peary Street. So that is currently council's position. Now we have the, funded, uh, the funding locked because at the moment, if we could have been at risk of losing the funding if it's through the 2020 financial cycle. So it's great that it's 2021 and potentially we've got extra funds we can also use as a result uh, of not going ahead with a point to point budget scheme as well. So we've got to ask members to support this um, uh, and uh, let's move forward and deliver. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. And I would just highlight um, for clarity, we're not just talking about the feasibility study, we are talking about the extension that we're giving to the funding agreement, which of course includes the East-West Bikeway, which is what I assume Councillor Sims was referring to. Of course, Councillor Sims wouldn't be referring to the North-South Corridor, which is not within our control and which has been delayed no, by construction. Bikeway, yeah. Thank you. Are there any other speakers to this? Councillor Martin. Yeah, look, uh, just a question first. Um, the um, the new company, which is to be allocated a permit in the new year to complement Airbike, are they a local company? Uh, we're not ready to release that information. As soon as we are, we'll make it available. Well, perhaps if I ask another way, is it an international company? The <laughs> same answer. <laughs> Okay, look, um, uh, since uh, the former Deputy Lord Mayor um, has strayed from what the discussion is, I know that the Chair will allow me to do also. I won't let you to fly too close to the sun, Councillor Martin, but I'll judge it on merit, please. I'm sure continue. you'll give me as much freedom as you give your colleague um, Hazar. Um, and look, I, I just wanted to say that this is not as rosy as uh, uh, some suggests, and, and look, I commend Helen for her optimism, but the truth of the matter is, and it's a great lesson, it's a great lesson for councillors working on a 2024 um, strategic plan, because here's the 2016-20, and front and centre of this is an undertaking to the people of Adelaide to complete an east-west and a north-south bikeway. That is to say, it's just missed completely. And in fact, later on tonight, we'll be talking about strategic initiatives and the ones that we've met, and we're on track for that one. Not in the term of this uh, report, and perhaps not even the next one, but we're on track. Um, the truth of the matter is the North-South is far from complete. Um, her sound is wrong. Uh, there is no deal in relation to North Terrace right down to War Memorial Drive. There is no outcome with regard to uh, Edwin Smith Drive to the top of Lefebvre Terrace, no outcome at all. It's part of the bikeway, it's nowhere near complete. And there is no east-west. There was a decision, a formalised decision of council to accept a Flinders-Franklin path. That was overturned by Assam, who argued in the last council. Point of order, sorry, I need to correct, just sorry, correction. Interjection on record, to correct, on record. Please. 
I didn't move a motion to change that. It was moved by Councillor Donovan and I supported that motion. Thank you. During the term of the last council, uh, Hassan brought in a petition signed by hundreds of people, all from the same Interjection. Um, Can we please? Interjection also, please, to the record that was brought in by Councillor Moran and Councillor Antic. Can I, can I just, just about right. can, can I just remind that, please? <laughs> We're not, can I just say, Chair? We're not debating chair. what happened at the last council. We're no, debating no, this motion. Can I just it. say, Chair, I've discovered in recent times that the frequency of interruptions from Hassan mean direct hits. He basically interrupts as a means of defending himself. <laughs> Councillor, the, the, clock, the clock is ticking, please. Direct your, direct your remarks to this recommendation. And you, I can see you've learned the lesson too. Um, uh, the, the bikeway is not delivered. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right, it's the shut up I was thinking about. The bikeway hasn't been delivered because of the frustrations that Team Adelaide have put in its path. Interjection, Councillor. Be... Councillor Moran moved at the last council meeting to stop work on the bikeway. At no, the that was Actually, Team Adelaide 1. Yeah, I was Team Adelaide. <laughs> Councillors, I won't accept any more interjections. <laughs> Councillor Martin, you have eight seconds left. Oh, now look, Chair, now look, now I understand now. exactly how this council works now. You interrupt the speaker and they can't get the point across that they're being misled. Do we have a show of hands for Councillor Martin? No, I don't want it, Chair. I don't want it. it I mean, it's obvious to everyone. Councillor Martin, are there any other speakers to this? There being none, I go back to Councillor Abiyad to say I have so much to say, but I'm not going to say it because there are video recordings of every single meeting for the many years that I decided to move a motion to bring in video recordings. That proves everything. That's all we're going to do, let's bring it back to the motion, speaker, please, Councillor. That, council. that Councillor Martin no. said is completely and utterly wrong. And there is actually proof. No. There is actual proof to go otherwise. To every, the comment, every comment he's where made. The and the fact of the matter remains, Councillor Sims and I at the last council together work to deliver an extension on the current South North. I remember the many discussions we've had. We moved the motion and we both supported it. And the motion that was moved at the time was to rip out the existing and improve, which would be an incredible outcome. And Councillor Sims wanted to make sure that there was an extension of the bike path all the way down the South North Corridor. We made sure the funding's available, we delivered it. That is an example of how Council delivers good outcomes. And we worked through that Councillor Sims and I. Um, Councillor Moran was right in the previous council to oppose the biking infrastructure and rip it out, and that's what we did. Yeah, try and right. Yeah. Yep, that's exactly what we did, and that was a that was a good outcome of council. Learned many lessons from it. The public have learned many lessons from it. A lot of people have to endure the hardship of it. I know it was a very difficult decision of council, but now we know everything we need to know about delivering those kind of projects, and we've agreed unanimously to support councillor. Donovan's motion in earlier this year to make sure we deliver on the bike path in the east-west. That is the truth, and that will happen. In which, uh, yeah, which century? We will move on. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those opposed? That's carried. <laughs> Moving on to item 5.7, meeting structure for 2020-2022. I seek a mover, Councillor Abia. Chair, I'll move with an addition, if that's okay. So I'll yes. move, um, there were two um, options there. So I'll move to, they both say option one, which is, I guess it's yeah, the second sure. option, I guess. So which is the adopting the second option with an addition 1.4. Yep, that's been sent. That voting on or recommending any items will be exclusive only to council and special council meetings. And I seek a seconder. seconder. Do I have oh. a seconder for that? Second. Councillor Canal. There can be no vote on anything except once a month. Councillor Abia, over to Thank you. you. And a quick note before we begin I will be narrower in my interpretation of what is relevant when we're debating this. Thank you, Chair. I'll take that into account. Um, councillors, at the last workshop, uh, we have gone through um, a significant amount of work with administration on how we potentially may meet uh, at the next council. There's been a, a lot of discussion for next year. 
Um, what I'm recommending is we go with what the Lord Mayor was speaking to us about specifically with regards to having one council meeting, one committee meeting or and one workshop or two committee meetings as necessary. Uh, the last uh, item of addition of 1.4 for me has been a pet hate for a very long time. Uh, every time we go to the chamber, we're having to move things on block where ratepayers are sitting in the gallery, unsure what that means and how council has reached, reached that decision without a specific debate. Uh, there are only items that have been sort of debated again that are brought up to the attention of the chamber. Otherwise, most things are done here at committee where we don't see uh, an extreme influx of people coming in on digital means or physically within the gallery. I think it's important for council uh, when they are considering to debate something, that they debate that specifically in the chamber, in an open council chamber where decisions are made. What this committee does and what gets reported on in the media in this committee are recommendations. And the media does a very good job at noting their recommendations. However, the public doesn't see it that way. The public see it as decisions of council, and that is not the case. They're recommendations to councils that yet are to be a decision. With that in mind, and for the purpose of transparency, I think it's important we have those debates uh, in full and vote on them in council. Which means those style of committees that we've gone today still allows for the same standing orders for members to speak, uh, whether they support or not support, ask questions, open up to a workshop, have more of an engagement from our administration in a committee and a workshop platform to inform us. And then at the end of that uh, specific item, if no one wants to add anything further, then we can move on to an item, uh, the, to the next item after that. Uh, I think that would give the administration enough feedback, it will give the elected members enough information about what the thoughts are of elected members. It will give us five days to cool down, go to the council meeting with specific amendments and make an informed decision once and for all that's very clear to the public. So look, I'd ask members to um, support this. Uh, I think it will actually make the workshops and the committees a little, a little bit less formal and it allows more engagement with the council staff to be able to get the advice we need to get. And if we don't get it at committee, we'll have the opportunity to do that uh, between committee and council uh, to be able to make informed decisions that are well known and well announced to the public. So I'd ask members to support uh, this recommendation for next year. And obviously, if it doesn't work for the year, then the following year, we can do something different. Thank you, you Councillor Nolan, wish to speak. Uh, Councillor Sims and Councillor Moran. No, totally. Oppose this. Um, this has been a long time um, coming. I, I know there was discussion around reducing the number of meetings earlier in the year, and it, it's been an issue that I know has been hanging over us like Damocles' sword. Well, tonight it's finally come, and um, we know what's intended. That is just one um, formal council meeting a month, and um, Councillor Abiad has gone a step further by saying that committees won't even be voting um, or making recommendations. So, assumably, the expectation would just be that we have endless workshops um, for um, a bulk of the month with one um, meeting um, once a month. I think that's going to mean we're going to have uh, marathon agendas. And um, I know some members here um, complain about late meetings. Well, they better get used to it because they're going to be here very, very late in the night um, as a result of um, this change. But more importantly, what we're going to see is less community accountability of this council, less community scrutiny of the council, because members of the community will not be able to come along and observe um, what's happening fortnightly. Instead, um, they'll have to wait until once a month. Um, as a result, there will be more power delegated to administration. Um, and I know administration, I, I do love them dearly, will say, oh, that's not true, we only follow your um, directions. But of course, when councillors are less active by default, that means that administration step in to plug the gaps. So it's more power for unelected officials, it's less power for the community, less power for us as councillors. And I think what this is about is actually trying to stifle and silence dissenting voices on this council. Those who use the opportunity of a council meeting to highlight issues, to bring issues to light on behalf of the community. I'm really disappointed that we're going down this path. I had hoped when there was discussion about this at committee previously, that the proponents of this would have considered, okay, we've had a difficult year, let's not push something that's going to be divisive but instead, um, there's a pitch to do this. 
Um, you know, democracy dies in the dark. Democracy dies when there is less scrutiny and less um, accountability. And I'm really worried about the implications of this for local democracy. I think it's a dangerous move. It puts us out of step with other councils in the state. Um, people talk about, oh, we've got to be more like Melbourne or Sydney. I'm not interested in what Melbourne or Sydney are doing. I um, view as my benchmark, what are the views of the community, but also what are other councils doing here in our state? And this would certainly make us the odd one out. We're one of the biggest councils. We have a significant remit. As Councillor Kouros has pointed out um, previously, we're a capital city council. We do have a broad remit. And I think the community expects, just, just 30 seconds. Could I get a show of hands, please? Continue. And I think the community expects their city councillors to be here meeting and representing their interests. And the idea that we cut the number of meetings so dramatically, I think, is um, absurd and uh, it is a real blow to local democracy in our city and I'm not in favour of it. Thank you. Before I pass to Councillor Moran, I just re uh, request some clarity from the CEO around whether this decision before us will actually expand the delegated authority the administration has. Yeah, through you, Chair. Delegated authority is re resolved upon by Council on an annual basis. So the only way that delegated authority can be increased is by resolution of Council. Thank you. Councillor Moran and then the Lord Mayor. Well, delegated authority will have to be increased, as the CEO knows, because you can't wait a month between decision making. Um, that is not nimble government. Uh, when uh, Hassan's put this at the last minute, the Lord Mayor assured me that the um, committee would mimic the council. Um, in the three years we sat together, we, we regretted that the committees were so out of touch with the business of, of council. It's regrettable that sometimes it seems to wave through in council, but that people can also attend the committees. Um, I think this, this ambushes it and makes it something much less attractive. The new members won't realise that, um, and that's why it's so clever. The ICAC Ombudsman only said in the paper today that workshops being used as an indicator for what the local government, that the councillors wanted, were completely outside um, the Act and should not do. Now you can, you are going to, the administration will use the workshops and the committees to gauge our views and that is not on. Um, a vote gauges our views. We don't just sniff the air, take a straw poll or, you know, um, somebody spoke loudly on this so we're going to go in that direction. That is not good governance and everybody that's experienced in local government knows that. It is an attempt to gag and um, and stop a noisy minority um, who are a nuisance. Assam and his gang have often um, really bemoaned the fact that we allow mo so many motions on notice, I think Simon said. How many? Many. Motions on notice are the bedrock of our democracy. They can't be mucked around by the staff. They, can they have to be presented. Um, so you're limiting the ability to 12 meetings a year, uh, four weeks plus between decision making. Hassam's um, amendment here, which will get through like a hot knife through butter, is just basically hobbles this council to not nimble government governance at all. Um, but it does limit the ability for the noisy independents to cause the majority faction discomfort and discomfort is what they're feeling. Melbourne and Sydney have once a month meetings. That's because their committees are legislative committees. They vote. They have portfolios for their members. So to say that they have, they have one get together a month, but every week they're voting. So they don't wait for a four week gap. I know this will get through, but it really is taking faction, taking the heat out of it is a really massive step backwards. And for you new members who aren't as nimble because you're new, um, it will also have the terrible effect of exhausting you. It's so long between your motion going up, the administration will get to you, colleagues. You need to be fresh and you need to meet fortnightly and you need to have votes like this. This meeting we've had tonight will never happen again. We're just like blur, 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 the administration will drone on. We can't, we, can't, um, we can't give our opinion because that would be a straw poll. So you, you Elvis has I'm left- I've got a show of hands for Councillor Moran. <laughs> Elvis has left the building and you just don't realise it. It's really sad. Lord Mayor. 
Thank you. Um, Councillor Murray, actually, uh, Councillor Sims, I think that you had actually already left council last term um, when we actually uh, changed the committee structure. So um, the difficulty with the committee, so we had non-decision making committees in the last term of council. Um, it's simply that the agenda didn't mirror the agenda that was going into council. So they became a little bit um, loose in terms of what was being presented. Some was strategic work, some was workshops, and some, some of it was what was going into council, but it didn't mirror the agenda. Um, I just want to actually confirm that there would be community access to the gallery for all our committee meetings, just as there are now. There will be media access to committee meetings, as there is now. Um, there are uh, the ability for community to do deputations at committee, just as there is now. There's the ability for community Quite to do order. deputations order, and there forums no at- capacity before yeah. committee. It's, that that's is, not, that's not a valid point of order, Councillor. Please, please continue along. You can't do a forum here, which is incorrect. Please continue along here. We have previously had deputations. No, we do not have um, We also, um, as Councillor Moran has said, the capital cities of Melbourne, Sydney, Perth, they all have various structures. Their committees do meet, but again, those decisions go into the council. So the recommendation goes into the council. They're not decisions, they're recommendations. So the council is the approving body of, the, of the, any of those recommendations. Um, so the key to this is that we actually uh, have a committee meeting that mirrors the agenda of council. Um, so we have discussions as we are now. It's simply not a decision making body. The decision is made in the council mm -hmm. and that we will have um, an absolute minimum of 12 um, going by the number of special meetings and things that we've had to call. I imagine there'll be far more than 12 council meetings that we will do, but that allows us to actually program as we need them at the times of the year that we need them. The other thing around motions on notice, um, I am also hoping that the motions on notice really talk to strategic intent and the reason that this year's just gone that we have had the number that we have is because they're actually informing the strategic plan that we are creating as a new council team as opposed to uh, the uh, existing uh, strategic plan uh, which we are actually only gone through um, getting to the end of Q2 of the last year of that strategic plan. So one would hope that the number of motions would actually reduce because it should be caught up within the strategic plan that we're actually going to approve in the beginning of the new year. And I would also ask councillors on that point to make sure that the key agendas that we want to deliver for our community and our rate cars are in the new strategic plan um, so that we can actually work to that as our guide. Um, that's, that's all, thank you. Thank you, Mark. So the Chair, just to clarify, in the past there have been the ability to have deputations to committee, but currently we don't have deputations. Is there the ability to do deputations within committee should we need to? It's entirely at the discretion of council. I'm getting an, uh, a yes and a no. Could I just ask governance? Not at the moment without an alteration to the standing orders. So you either need to authorise through resolution or authorise the CEO to update the standing orders to incorporate. Okay, so we do have the ability to do it should we wish to, um, we just currently don't do it. And we did previously do it, so my apologies members, because actually I've been in so many versions of our uh, process here um, that um, the fact that we can, we can but we don't uh, doesn't mean that we can't should we wish to. Thank you Lord Mayor. Any other speakers on this? Yeah, Councillor Noel and Councillor Martin. I mean, uh, but there's been, as Sarah put in the first uh, word, is that uh, it has been an interesting and enjoyable year uh, in, our first, in the first year of our council term. I mean, but if we're thinking about it, we are developing our understandings and policies. Um, and you don't do that by debating and, and point scoring, which happens quite a lot around here. And it is important. <laughs> It is important, and yes, yes, I suppose the greatest humour is over there. Um, but it is, if you think about it, we have workshops. The workshops assist us to have a conversation to start to develop an understanding of the various areas that we're, we're talking about, whether it be strategy or whatever it is. And 
they help us then to start as we put the uh, put those uh, thoughts together uh, through this sort of committee process. It is about discussing, you know, the, the, the whatever's uh, coming up, but it's also the understanding, uh, the, you know, the nuanced uh, variations to make sure that you are putting something very hol uh, you know holistic through. Um, it can't be said that we don't change a lot of these motions. They do change uh, when we get into council. So therefore, we're not really doing anything. Um, you know, people still come along and say, well, I don't like that, and we'll come along afterwards and we'll, we'll adjust it. So that debate still occurs. And I must say, the there is virtually a debate on most issues uh, other than some very, you know, just very uh, basic ones. So, you know, I think it, it is important that we, uh, we as councillors certainly uh, debate and discuss because we're now put, uh, coming together with an understanding of whatever the, the, the issue is. And then, then we can come to the final point, not having to worry so much about uh, taking a position now in, in committee, but actually debating it at the end where appropriate and, you know, really coming to a final, uh, you know, very well worked uh, outcomes of, and uh, motions. Right now, we're, we're playing a bit of a game with some and, uh, and adjustments and things like that, rather than uh, opening it up and discussing in general so that we can hone uh, you know, the motions so that they are effective and deliver in a nice, concise way. Right now, it's a bit of just you know, a, a bit of a game. Councillor Martin. Look, this initiative is Lord Mayor Sandy Bashaw and Assam Abiyad and Team Adelaide's coup de grace to democracy of the city of Adelaide. It is a coup de grace. It is anti-democratic. It is consistent with the same Lord Mayor who tried to put a gag on elected members bringing motions. Please stick to the recommendation, Councillor. It is consistent. That is what I'm saying. That is the connection. It is absolutely consistent with what the Lord Mayor tried to do by imposing a gag on elected members. Point of order, it is consistent. Point of order Chair. Yes, I right. did not try and impose a gag. I was trying to put a governance process around how we bring motions into the chamber. Stop Thank you for it, is, it is yeah. consistent with the Lord Mayor who attempted to alter Point of motions order. on notice by elected members. It is consistent entirely. This council is completely undemocratic. This faction-ridden council, as it was described in the newspaper recently. The Lord Mayor is proposing that we have a series of discussions without any kind of decision, and from which the administration will take away such information it's gathered telepathically to frame recommendations to go towards council. It is, in the words of the Independent Commissioner Against Corruption, dangerous. Salisbury Council has warned, been warned quite recently, in the last 48 hours, that it is inappropriate for a council workshop to inform a decision of the administration. And yet it happens here. There's a confidential item tonight that's coming up. There was no vote on it. It was a workshop, and the recommendation has been framed exactly. by the administration exactly. on the basis of the telepathy that, it received. That is incorrect, Councillor Monk. It, it is. It is correct, I'm afraid. I'm, and I'm afraid look, it's not. We can discuss it in confidence, but that is No, it. we don't have to talk about it in confidence. I'd be delighted that if uh, uh, Mr Lander wanted to have a look at this council, he should do so, because this is the culture of this council. Minimise debate, avoid criticism, make yourself a low target and kill democracy in the process. That is exactly what's occurring. We, we are a closed door council. Despite all of the nuanced, well, we can introduce a public forum delegation uh, item on the agenda of committee, it ain't gonna happen. The truth of the matter is there are now just 12 occasions a year when we will meet. And the citizens of this city know tonight how much longer they have to put up with Lord Mayor Vachur and talk Team Adelaide. It is precisely 34 meetings. That is it. This council has 34 occasions on which it can make decisions in the next three years. If you are not ashamed of that, if you are not ashamed of voting for that, then God help you. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Kerr. Thanks, Chair. Um, look, I'm compelled to just uh, to put a perspective here. We're hearing a lot about this. Um, there is a there's a um, 
there's a really strong view being put forward that uh, the public don't want to change like this. The public, uh, who are the ultimate arbiters of this, um, think that this is uh, a, a, a well, coup de grace, so a death blow to democracy. Um, I'm going to put the perspective that in my view, um, and I'm very, very, very solid in this view, the majority of the public <coughs> thinks that this country is over-governed. The majority of the public think, think the majority of the public, I think, believe that every level of government uh, we are over governed, over governed. They think that there are too many, there is too much impetus to make too many decisions, to pass too many regulations, to pass too many laws, because that is the raison d'etre of politicians and political class. I'm only motivated to say this because of the abject fervour that's come from one side in presenting only one side of the argument here. There are two sides to the argument here. There are two sides to the argument, and the other side of the argument is that belief, which I'm very solid about, and the other side of the argument uh, is also <clears throat> That, um, that committees, we do have a problem with the public believing, uh, with the public believing that decisions at committee represent a final decision of council. That is a problem. That hasn't been addressed, unfortunately, by the other side. Now, I am a relatively new councillor. I want to hear from the experienced councillors, but I'm not hearing a, I am not hearing, uh, I'm not hearing a balanced perspective of the other side. And that is why I'm motivated to speak uh, in, in this nature. So there is a real problem that I've seen that, that we have got two sets of decisions that are made. And uh, uh, finally, there we are, you know, we're not meeting as often. Well, we are meeting as often. We are still having meetings. One other observation I would make is that I actually think we are we are a very terrific council. It is actually a very good group of people. And the best, the best, <laughs> the best councillors, councillors, the best councillors, the 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 best. Can I tell uh, them what you say. Go ahead, Anne. All remarks are directed through the chair. Councillor Kira, you've got 40 seconds left. Um, the best that this council demonstrates is when we are speaking uh, without voting. When, when we speak, uh, when, when we come together and we speak without voting, when it's informal and we are just speaking our minds, there isn't grandstanding. Uh, that tends to bring out the best in this chamber, the best, most uh, conducive uh, sort of uh, environments have happened in that situation. So uh, th these are issues on the other side, and it's the abject fervour on the one side that that makes me really uh, wonder about the uh, you know the overall um, argument here. Thank you, Councillor Kerr. Any other speakers? Councillor Donovan, followed by Councillor Kerrs. Oh. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm a little bit torn on this one. Uh, I can see the pros and cons. The thing that I find challenging about our current meeting schedule is when we have random meetings on Mondays and Thursdays um, because I have other commitments at those times. So that's the thing that I find most frustrating. I feel as though adopting this structure may increase the likelihood of that because we would be decreasing essentially our standard uh, council meetings, although I accept that it's not adjusting the total number of meetings. Um, but I also detest the epic meetings when we are, well, three a month, four a month. Three plus one, that's, that's a, you know, a possibility. No interjections, so, please. Um, and the other thing that I uh, detest is the epic meetings that go until, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night, which we've had far fewer of recently. But I can't see practically how reducing the number of meetings is going to um, meet our requirements. So I'm uh, I'm open to all of the possibilities, but I haven't yet heard anything persuasive that would suggest that we that there's content reduction that would lead to a reduction in the number of meetings of council. Thank you, Council Kuros. Thanks, Chair. Um, I agree with Councillor Kira and I, I actually agree with Councillor Donovan as well in the sense that I'm not sure if, if this is, is the way to go, but say, um, hearing the arguments tonight, there isn't anything to suggest to me that uh, that we shouldn't just give it a go. Um, I haven't heard anything substantial enough uh, from the experienced councillors except for them throwing insults or whatever you want to call it um, at to the Lord Mayor or um, insinuations in regards to conspiracy theories or whatever you want to call it. Besides point of order. Of their... I wasn't insinuating anything. That's not I was being very direct. Whatever was coming 
from their argument, I just just got lost with everything else that they were, whatever they were trying to say. So I'm actually, as a new councillor, willing to give it a go uh, for 12 months. I've gone through this system. I would like to see how the uh, this system would work. And of course, uh, we can adjust it at the end of the year. Um, and you know, if it proves to be correct, then we will uh, we'll adjust it back. But if it works efficiently, then so be it, we'll, we'll keep it. Thank you. Do we have any other speakers on this item? There being none, I'll just make a few remarks um, before I pass to Councillor Abia to sum up. Um, I would say that uh, having looked at some big institutions and, and worked in uh, and with large government departments and what have you for a while, I do think we can be more effective in how we operate as a council. Um, uh, it, Perhaps this is to sway Councillor Donovan more so. I think we could see more effective decision making with this model because what we'll have is a, is a deep dive with policy, one a month. Then we'll have, uh, and that is a time that we can really unpack an entire policy area um, and put our thoughts forward on that. Um, after that, we can, in the following week, we'll have a, a committee where we don't make decisions that are then reversed at the following council. Um, that committee will mirror the council agenda and will still allow us publicly um, to uh, interrogate each item that's coming before council to get clarity, to ask questions and to inform an amendment that we might wish to put at that council meeting, which is in the following week. And it will still allow for um, an, another meeting to be held on a Tuesday, um, uh, which is uh, precisely what we do now. And there will probably be many months where we do hold those extra meetings especially considering um, uh, uh, the many and the quantum of the projects that we have coming up that we need to get through. Um, and so it's because of those reasons that I am all for this council trying something new, because I think given the uh, over 800 FTE that we have working under us, it is important for us to make clear um, uh, 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 administrative and strategic decisions with how we want this organisation to go. I don't think that is the case um, now, although I would echo Councillor Kira's points, we are still a very, very good council and I've dealt with a lot of them. Um, uh, but I do believe we can be better, which is why I'm very willing uh, to try this new model. And with that, I'll pass to Councillor Abia to sum up. Thank you, Chair. Um, look, you look at uh, multiple models uh, across the country, be it in private or public sector, uh, the reality of the matter remains, it's not the quantum of how many meetings you have, it's the quality of decisions that you make. And the qualities of decisions you make is based on being well informed inside the council meeting, at a chamber, at a committee, at a workshop, and also most importantly, being well informed in public. So having the opportunity to go out and engage with our ratepayers and feed that information back to council. But the most distressing thing for me as part of this process, we've got over 16 staff sitting in this room here today, which I'd argue probably worth more than two to $2.5 million a year of cost to us. And we haven't really heard much from them. Right? We have really have not heard much from them. And in every board meeting I've attended, and I've sat on, on, on commercial boards, I've sat on public boards, I've sat on non-for-profit boards, we are constantly hearing from the experts. We are trying to gauge the experts that we've hired to do the work for us on our behalf and our right players to understand and form a decision and help them also to understand the public view when it comes to that decision. Now, I don't hear that often. And that for me is a big concern. I hear us talking. I know very clearly what people want to do in North Adelaide and in the city and the South. And I get that. I hear it from the elected members, but I don't hear it from anywhere else. To Councillor Donovan's point, there are potentially two meetings in committee and a workshop that will also be on a Tuesday. I think what this will do is actually structure the meetings for us on three Tuesdays in a row. Now, council has not used, and I've been in council now for 10 years, uh, nine years, um, and if you look at what council has in the past, we've been duplicating a lot. We have the power to rescind motions if we disagree with them. We have the power to lay things on the table. We have the power to defer an item if we need to seek more information out of the council meeting. Uh, we have the opportunity to still have the committee meeting actually mirror the council meeting. We just don't have to have the debate and the vote. We can actually talk and share our ideas and hear from our staff in a very informal way. That's something that Council Donovan's been telling me about for the last 12 months. I just don't feel that there's the opportunity in an informal capacity publicly to be able to discuss ideas. 
That is what a workshop's for. That's what committee's for. And if this year, I'm sorry, we were just councillors. Councillors, you may be sorry, um, but councillor Alberto is speaking. Please be silent. We, we were just talking about what he was raising. That's all well and good, but councillor Alberto has a floor. If the um, if if this year is a test for any of us, we have scheduled this year about roughly 18 to 20 meetings scheduled a year. Okay, we have far surpassed that, and we will also this year as required. If there was urgent business, a special council meeting can be called immediately by the Lord Mayor and a couple of councillors. Guess what? The Lord Mayor doesn't have to call it. A few councillors can call it. All right, that's not the challenge. Can I have a show of hands, please. Thank you. Please oh, continue. Was that the vote? <laughs> that was. Please continue, Councillor Abia. Thank you, Chair. Uh, again, just in summing up, uh, I am sick and tired of people using factional lines to suit them. There's been many decisions of this council that are not yeah, factional. The real reason. There's been very many faction, many decisions of this council that have not been factional. Tonight is a perfect example. It just seems that there's specific people, Chair, that nitpick at specific members in this council to suit their own personal agendas. I think it's really important for the sake of the city and informing that this potentially will be our last committee for the year, that we start next year fresh with a new schedule, one that we can be all maturing, have ownership over and give it a fresh go and be open-minded about it. Change is not easy. I know some councillors have been embedded and wedded to not have any change whatsoever and people freak out when there's change. But if there is no discomfort, there is no change, there is no outcome. Sometimes it needs a bit of courage and the courage to try. This is 12 months of trying. This is what we're doing. If it works, fantastic, we have a new model. If it doesn't work, then we can re-alter, re-change and reconfigure. I'd ask members to please uh, support this and uh, I'll put it back to you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Obiad. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those opposed? Uh, division. That is carried. We cannot call the division in committee, Councillor Moran. That is carried. Okay, and with that, we will move on to item 5.8, the strategic plan progress report, quarter one, 2019-2020. Can I seek a mover for this? A mover for this, please. Councillor Moran, a seconder, please. Councillor Noel. Councillor Moran, do you wish to speak? No. Councillor Noel. Councillor Moran, do any other people wish to speak? Yep. Summed up, I put that to the vote. All those in favour? That is carried. Thank you. Uh, item 5.9, unrecoverable debt write off. I seek a mover for this report. Councillor Moran, seconder. Councillor Noll. Councillor Moran, do you wish to speak? No. Councillor Noll. Members, do you wish to speak? Summed up. There being none, Councillor Moran is summed up. I put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those opposed? That is carried. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, staff. Uh, moving on to item councillors, if we could please be composed for this final run here. Item 5.10, building inspection policies. I seek a mover for this motion. Councillor Moran, a seconder. Councillor Kuros. Councillor Moran, do you wish to speak? Councillor Kuros. No. Are there any questions or does anyone wish to speak to this motion? There being none, Councillor Moran has summed up. I put that to the vote. All those in favour? Sorry, All those opposed? <laughs> Councillor Abiyad, are you voting with us? Sorry, yes, I did. All those in favour? All those opposed? That is carried. That brings us to uh, number six on the agenda, which is Council Member Discussion Forum items. I have one flag from the Lord Mayor and then Councillor Martin. Lord uh, thank you, Chair. Um, members, I just uh, want to acknowledge today is the International Day of People with Disability, um, which is held on December 3rd each year. Um, the International Day of People with Disability is a United Nations sanctioned day that is celebrated internationally and aims to increase public awareness, understanding and acceptance of people with disability and celebrate their achievements and contributions. The theme for the day this year is promoting the participation of persons with disabilities in their leadership, taking action on the 2030 development agenda. Um, the City of Adelaide is committed to breaking down barriers to participation and our Disability Access and Inclusion Plan 2019 to 2022 was endorsed by Council in February this year and outlines a range of actions we are taking. Um, the, um, sorry, I missed a bit. The, um, 
According to the United Nations, the 2019 theme focuses on the empowerment of persons with disabilities for inclusive, equi equitable and sustainable development as envisaged by the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which pledges to leave no one behind and recognises disability as a cross-cutting issue to be considered in the implementation of its 70 sustainability development goals. There have been a number of activities which have been held across the city today, including the Special Olympics Family Fun Day and the Torch Run at the Zoo. Um, we also launched the um, inclusion plan with the, uh, Minister Lansing, the state government, which was launched at the Martin Park. Um, and there are other opportunities such as Celebrate on the Square, December the 6th in Victoria Square, and Creative Abilities Art Exhibition, which will be until the 13th of December at Carpoo. I'd like to thank and acknowledge the ongoing contribution of our Access and Inclusion Advisory Panel members who meet for the last time this year tomorrow. They are supporting our staff to ensure key projects such as the Quinton Kenahan Inclusive Play Space and the recently opened Changing Places facility in James Place are at best practice standard. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Very, very worthy update. Councillor Martin. Oh, uh, just a, a small matter. I wanted to alert members to a flyer which has been distributed in Adelaide in relation to the Crows bid for part two. Um, and I will give a copy to everyone uh, just in case they don't get one. No, it's very generous of you. No, my pleasure. My Thank pleasure. you, Councillor Martin. <laughs> Councillor Donovan. Just a brief one. I had the opportunity to uh, attend the um, a deep dive uh, that was hosted by the Office of Recreation, Sport and Racing, and was looking at their game on consultation and strategy. And of interest, I'm sure to all councillors, there were eight themes that were identified from the game on consultation that are currently being further explored. And one of the themes that the Office of Rec, Sport and Racing identified as being key for increasing physical activity participation across South Australia and uh, for the purposes of um, improving health and wellbeing, decreasing obesity within uh, children and the general population was... No. <laughs> active transport. No. Office of Rec, Sport and Racing highlighted the need for active transport. So in alignment with our uh, current strategies around the city access strategy and the integrated movement plan, I'm sure we will also continue to keep that as a top priority. Thank you, Councillor Donovan. Are there any other discussion forum items? There being none, we'll move to item 7.1, exclusion, exclusion of the public uh, to consider uh, an item of confidence. Can I have a mover for that? Councillor Abbey, I'm a seconder. Councillor Ho. Councillor Abbey, well, is there a... Councillor Abbey, do you wish to speak? Councillor Ho, any discussion? Councillor Abbey, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. All right. Anyone who uh, isn't relating to this motion and any members of the public, could you please leave? Thank you. I declare the meeting closed.